even if he had merely lost confidence in the man's judgment. Marshall and Aikson agreed, though they were cautious. Marshall thought that if SCAP were relieved it might be difficult to get their military appropriations for rearmament and NATO, through Congress. The Secretary of State predicted that the dismissal would trigger the biggest fight of your administration. 28 They pondered stratagems for an hour. Truman, in his own words, was careful not to disclose that I had already reached a decision. Aixon thought the problem was not so much what should be done as how it should be done. It was clear to all of them that Marshall and Bradley needed time to confer with the chiefs. The president must avoid any appearance of having disregarded military advice. Therefore the meeting adjourned until 9 a.m. Saturday, with Truman instructing Marshall to review, in the meantime, the Department of the Army's file of Tokyo messages to and from MacArthur. As it happened, all of them except the president gathered in Aixon's office that same afternoon to discuss a possible compromise which had been suggested in the Pentagon calling the general home for consultation. The Secretary of State thought this a road to disaster. To get him back in Washington in the full panoply of his commands, he said, with his histrionic abilities, would not only gravely impair the President's freedom of decision but might well imperil his own future. The others agreed. The first attempt to save MacArthur's face was abandoned. 29 Saturday's meeting was brief. Marshall reported that he had studied the files and agreed with Harriman, the general should have been recalled two years earlier. They discussed a second compromise, giving Ridgway full responsibility for the prosecution of the war and keeping MacArthur in the Daiki as proconsul of Japan. This was rejected as impractical, though apart from a suggestion that it might complicate Ridgway's life there was no real explanation of why. One has the feeling that by now the group scented blood and had resolved individually to reduce MacArthur to impotence. The chiefs were still away. Truman said he could wait. He asked Bradley to tell them to search their consciences, remaining in session all day Sunday, if necessary, until they could recommend a course of action. Sunday morning Truman told Aikson that he had sought the Council of Treasury Secretary John W. Snyder in this matter, but he didn't disclose what Snyder had said, and once more he refrained from tipping his own hand. The big struggle that Sabbath was in the Pentagon. The administration's dislike and resentment of Scap was not shared by all his fellow officers. According to Truman, Bradley approached the question entirely from the point of view of military discipline. As he saw it, there was a clear case of insubordination and the general deserved to be relieved of command. In fact, Bradley has always been careful to point out that the chiefs never called MacArthur insubordinate. The president was closer to the truth when he said in 1959 that the general would never have been recalled had the Pentagon been directing events in Korea. Like him, the chiefs believed in hot pursuit. One of them, Sherman, repeatedly said during their marathon meeting that he had been very fond of MacArthur since Incheon. Rather than mortify him, the admiral suggested, Marshall, as a fellow five-star general, should fly to Tokyo and warn him that he would be removed if he didn't mend his ways. Having declined to make the wake trip, Marshall coldly refused this one, too, and Collins concurred. Sherman reluctantly agreed that the general would have to go because he lacked sympathy with the administration. Thereupon the chiefs voted unanimously to recommend that he be dismissed because the military must be controlled by civilian authority in this country, and the Far East commander should be more responsive to directives from Washington. 30 at 9 a.m. Monday Bradley laid this verdict before the president. Harriman and the secretaries of state and defense having endorsed it, Truman revealed that he had been determined to do just that since Thursday. Tuesday afternoon they met again to discuss changes in command, Ridgway would be the new scap and James Van Fleet, who, ironically, detested the Korean stalemate even more than MacArthur, would take over the Eighth Army. The president would issue a public statement, with deep regret I have concluded that General of the Army Douglas MacArthur is unable to give his wholehearted support to the policies of the United States and of the United Nations. The instructions to MacArthur would be sent in diplomatic code to Pusan, where Masio would turn them over to Secretary of the Army Frank Pace, then touring the front.
Pace would have the unenviable task of flying to Tokyo and handing them to the General.31 The presidential orders, Truman decided, would be drafted by Marshall with Exxon's advice. That was a mistake. Both men were hostile toward the Supreme Commander, and he reciprocated. The Secretary of State, the more tactful of the two, had his hands full, first keeping a tense appointment with Senators Pate McCurran and Stiles Bridges, they wanted to tell him that the president was heading for a fight with MacArthur and was sure to lose, and then routing John Foster Dulles out of bed and dispatching him to Tokyo, to assure Prime Minister Shigeru Yoshida that America's policy toward Japan would be unchanged. Dulles wanted time to consult Taft, Aixon told him it was out of the question. Thus the version which would reach MacArthur was Marshall's, gruff and abrupt. After a terse sentence notifying the addressee that he was being relieved as SCAP, UN Commander, and SINCF, it concluded, you will turn over your commands, effective at once, to Lieutenant General Matthew B. Ridgway. You are authorized to have issued such orders as are necessary to complete desired travel to such place as you select. My reasons for your replacement will be made public concurrently with the delivery to you of the foregoing message. Even Napoleon, exiled to Elba by the Treaty of Fontainebleau, was designated sovereign of the island, assigned an escort of 400 members of the Imperial Guard, and granted a handsome annuity. And Napoleon's orders were drawn up by his nation's enemies.32 By acting firmly, the administration had crossed the Rubicon, if not the Yalu, and had resolved, as far as the White House was concerned, the vexing problem posed by the intractable commander in Japan. But in the United States the executive branch of the government is only one of several forces which determine the country's handling of foreign affairs. The others are the two great political parties, the people, and the fourth estate. It was all very well for the Secretary of State to write insouciantly that we settled down to endure heavy shelling from the press and Congress that the relief was bound to and did produce. The manner in which the objective was achieved was also bound to and did produce seismic changes in the public's conception of the administration and its Asian policies. To cite but one example, the establishment of a sensible relationship with China was relegated to a sterile deep freeze from which it did not begin to thaw for almost a quarter century. There were, to be sure, other causes of this. But the outburst of emotion which followed the sacking of the general was surely the bitterest of them. And it did not have to happen that way. Great though the provocation in the Daiki undeniably was, the problem could have been met another way, Sherman had suggested one, and it was not the only one. Aixon described the situation more astutely when he said, there was no doubt what General MacArthur deserved, the sole issue was the wisest way to administer it. So it was, and it could scarcely have been administered more unwisely. 33 at 6 p.m. Tuesday, the President, having signed the necessary orders, departed to dine at Blair House, leaving Exxon, Harriman, Marshall, and Bradley to sort out the details. They thought they had about 20 hours to do it, Pace, it had been decided, wouldn't call at the Daiki until the following afternoon. But Tokyo, as Sebald notes, was flooded with press reports indicating an open break between MacArthur and the administration. Shortly before 7 p.m. William D. Maxwell, managing editor of the Chicago Tribune, phoned his Washington correspondent, Walter Trowan, to relay a tip from Japan. An important resignation, it was rumored, was expected there the next day. Trowan rode to the White House to ask Joseph Short, who had replaced Charlie Ross in December for a comment. The new press secretary said, there's nothing to it. Trowan started to write a story anyhow, but tore it from his typewriter when his managing editor phoned again to say, forget that MacArthur tip. We've checked this source in Tokyo, and it turns out the fellow doesn't know what he's talking about. 34 short, unaware of Maxwell's second call, burst in on Aixon and the others, the firing squad, as MacArthur later called them, and said the Tribune has the whole story and is going to print it tomorrow morning. Bradley hurried over to Blair House with word of this. The general, he predicted, would quit before he could be dismissed. It was at this point 
Truman writes in his memoirs, that he decided we could not afford the courtesy of a formal change in command. At the time he put it more trenchantly, the son of a bitch isn't going to resign on me. I want him fired. Gavin Long observes dryly, undoubtedly President Roosevelt would have managed things better. 35 Meanwhile the commercial cable carrying Musio's instructions had broken down. Bradley drove to the Pentagon and wrote out a longhand message to Pace, asking him to fly to Tokyo within the hour, advising Scap of his relief. Bradley paced the communications room while awaiting the reply cable received. It never came. Pace, trapped by a power failure, was conferring with Ridgway in a tent near the front. At 11 p.m. Bradley, now frantic, called the president to say that he was radioing MacArthur directly. This too was inexplicably delayed, and no one in Tokyo had an inkling of what was coming when Short, who was hurriedly mimeographing the gag rule, Truman's January letter to MacArthur, and other relevant documents for the press, alerted White House correspondents to an extraordinary 1 a.m. press conference. At 12.56 a.m. he gave them the story, and at 1.03 the wire services were beaming it around the globe. 36 Truman was asleep by then, but the event already bore his unmistakable stamp. Here, as so often in his feisty administration, he had done the right thing, in this case avoiding the hazards of a general war, in the wrong way. Because he insisted that MacArthur be fired, instead of permitting him to retire gracefully, millions questioned the president's motives. The deed seemed punitive, even indecent, and it violated all the traditions which the general cherished. The unceremonious, peremptory dismissal denied him the right to deliver a farewell address to his troops, to counsel Ridgeway, to speak to the Japanese people, or to discuss the forthcoming peace treaty with any Nipponese officials. Clark Lee wrote, nothing could alter the summary language of the order, nor the implication that after so many years of service MacArthur had become a terrible threat to the security of the United States, so dangerous that he must at one instant be stripped of all command and power, such a peril that he could not be treated with ordinary decency and customary military protocol. The Duke of Marlborough, boarding a plane in New York, said, it's been done in a rather unceremonious way. Don't you think? Carlos Romulo asked, was the need to swing the axe in just that fashion? 37 While the clock in the White House press room read 103, it was three minutes past 3.00 p.m. in Tokyo, April 11th, the day and hour of Shigeru Yoshida's first garden party of the year. Yesterday there had been a breath of spring in this land of the chrysanthemum, and MacArthur had observed that the cherry blossoms were firm if not yet quite in bloom. Today had dawned chilly, however, with thick, lowering clouds and gusts of harsh wind swirling around the American embassy compound. Late in the morning it had begun to pour, drops beating on glistening umbrellas as steadily as a drum roll. Eerie Huff, dismayed, had cried, Oh, why does it always have to rain on the day of the Prime Minister's garden party? 38 It was not raining on the general, since he never attended anyone's parties. His luncheon visitors that day were Senator Warren Magnuson and William Stearns, a Northwest Airlines executive. At the last minute Huff had also decided to stay home, though not to spare his wife's dress. A newspaper man, warned by his Washington Bureau of Shorts impending press conference, had phoned to say, be sure to listen to the three o'clock news broadcast. We think President Truman is going to say something about MacArthur. Huff tried to phone Jean, but she and the general were already with their guests. Knowing that MacArthur was planning to go directly from lunch to a siesta, Huff left word to call him. Then he turned on his radio. At first there were no items of interest, but just before the commentator signed off, he said, stand by for an important announcement. Moments later it came. In the next instant Huff's phone rang. It was Jean. Did you call, Sid? He said, yes. It's important. I just heard a flash over the radio from Washington saying that the general has been relieved of his commands. She said, wait a moment. Repeat that, Sid. The general is here.
He did, and she said, All right, Sid, thanks for calling, ringing off before he could say more. 39 Huff's phone rang again. It was the signal call, asking whether he would be home to accept an important message for the General Bradley's direct cable, delivered at last. It arrived in a brown army envelope, stamped in red letters, Action for MacArthur. His eyes damp, Huff carried it to the big house. A half dozen reporters had gathered at the lower compound gate. One said, What's the news? Has he got the word yet? Huff held up the envelope and replied, This is probably it. He entered through the great gates, crossed the wide reception hall, where the flags of the generals passed hung from their splendid stands, and climbed the curving stairway. Jean, her face taut, met him at the door of MacArthur's bedroom. Huff said helplessly, Here it is. Anything I can do? No, thanks, Sid, she said, taking it and turning away swiftly. There isn't anything anybody can do right now. Inside the general opened it, scanned it, and said, Jeannie, we're going home at last. Forty Larry Bunker had reached Yoshida's party early, he had to be back at the Daiki when MacArthur returned there after his siesta. The rain had stopped, and prospects for a pleasant afternoon were improving when one of William F. Marquot's officers told Bunker of the newscast. Soon the guests were buzzing about it. Yoshida, deeply shocked, left the receiving line and required a half hour to compose himself. Meanwhile Sebald had arrived from the bi-weekly meeting of the Allied Council. George Stratmeyer's wife told him what they had heard, and after confirming it, a message from State had just been delivered at his office, instructing him to calm the Japanese until Dulles could arrive, Sebald conferred with Yoshida in the Prime Minister's upstairs study, expressing the hope that neither he nor his cabinet would resign, which would have been the traditional Japanese gesture of responsibility for any diplomatic misfortune affecting Dai Nippon. The Prime Minister assented, nodding slightly. He was, Sebald recalls, visibly shaken. 41 So was every other high official, Japanese and American, though MacArthur retained his poise better than most. One of his first calls was to Whitney. Court, have you heard the news? He asked, and then began telling Whitney what his responsibilities to Ridgeway would be. The aide would have none of it, if the general was leaving, so was he. Wearing his old robe, MacArthur received Bunker, Tony Story, and Dr. Canada. All felt the same, they didn't want to remain without him. The general made no attempt to dissuade them. Then he said that he didn't know who had been on the firing squad, but the language of his orders convinced him that George Marshall pulled the trigger. Since they permitted him to complete desired travel to such place as he might select, he was planning a leisurely tour of the Philippines, Oceania, and Australia, when he received a Trans-Pacific telephone call from, of all people. Herbert Hoover, for whom it was the middle of the night. The 77-year-old former president had succeeded in doing what the White House, the State Department, and the Joint Chiefs could not, getting through to the general promptly and directly. He had heard what had happened and had talked to several Republican leaders. They wanted MacArthur to come straight home as quickly as possible, before Truman and Marshall and their crowd of propagandists can smear you. Details would follow in a few hours. 42 Huff was watching the general closely, trying to figure out how he was feeling underneath his tense but quiet manner. I got the impression that he was aggrieved, that he had suffered a bit of heartbreak. But he never said a word to indicate his attitude, and all of us realized that it would be a grave error to make any sympathetic noises in his presence. Ordinarily, Huff said, there was a lot of warm friendliness about MacArthur but in times of crisis he seemed to prefer to be alone, to fight it out by himself or with only Jean's comfort and help. Later that afternoon, in his office, he buzzed Bunker, put a last batch of papers in his out-basket, and said quietly, you needn't bring anything more in to me. 43 But then he opened up to Sebald. The diplomat arrived at the Daiki in tears, unable to speak, the general lit his cigarette for him and motioned him to the worn leather couch. The dismissal, he said, merely reflected the judgment of one individual. What hurt, he said, 
was the method the president had chosen, it was cruel to be publicly humiliated after 52 years in the army. Sebald, controlling himself, said, The present state of Japan is a monument to you and I would hope that everything possible could be done to preserve it. MacArthur was gloomy about the American position in the Far East. Peking was on the march, Tibet would fall, and then Indochina. He asked, how could Red China be more at war against us? And predicted long UN casualty lists in Korea, all to no avail. Sebald felt that this proud, sensitive, and determined man, who had followed a destiny which now had evaporated, was deeply hurt and, perhaps, momentarily defeated. Watching and listening to him was the most painful interview I have ever had. 44 It was clear to all around the general that he resented charges that, as he put it, he had been conspiring in some underhanded way with the Republican leaders, when in fact he had taken no part whatsoever in a political situation. This was, of course, completely untrue. Martin had used his letter unscrupulously, but it had been a political document to start with, Hoover's message bore that out. Further confirmation rapidly followed. Earl Blake cabled, time is of the essence to offset administration hatchet men. In the early hours of Wednesday, April 11, while Americans were picking up their morning newspapers and reading of MacArthur's recall, Republican senators and congressmen met in Martin's office. With Taft presiding, and with the consent of the Democratic leadership, they invited the general to address a joint session on Capitol Hill. As they broke up, Martin told reporters that in the light of the latest tragic development, there would also be a full-fledged congressional investigation of the government's foreign and military policies. He added darkly that during the meeting the question of possible impeachments was discussed, implying that not just Truman but his entire administration, perhaps even the Joint Chiefs, might be tried. When one party accuses the other of impeachable offenses, the issue is obviously explosive. Yet MacArthur, ordering his staff to pack quickly, he told Bunker that he wanted to take off on Tuesday, plainly did not grasp that in the United States he had become the symbol of a fierce cause, with an immense following. Like Wainwright in 1945, he appeared to feel that his countrymen would reject him as a loser. He told Story to draft his flight plan so that they wouldn't land in California until night had fallen. He said, we'll just slip into San Francisco after dark, while everybody's at dinner or the movies. 45 The president's decision was well received in Europe, Mackie's sacked trumpeted a headline in the London Evening Standard, while Sawyer said Truman had acted under the vaunt de pacifique of the world's peoples, Almond devoted its front page to the news carrying Lord a revocation and la declaration presidentielle and commenting editorially that the Allies could not yield to un parle de sa trempe, a tall talker, like MacArthur. Soldiers in Korea were undismayed. The British Commonwealth Brigade threw a party along the 38th parallel, and from Seoul, where Ridgeway had become a popular rival to MacArthur, Murish Kumark of the New York Times cabled, the widespread feeling among officers of field rank is that the relationship between general headquarters in Tokyo and the 8th Army in Korea will become more pleasant. Yet there were omens of ugliness ahead, for those who believed in the supernatural, at any rate. E. J. Khan, Jr., cabled the New Yorker, almost at the very moment yesterday that the news of General MacArthur's relief was coming over the radio at the divisional command post on the Western Front where I have been spending a few days, a terrific wind blew across the campsite, leveling a couple of tents. A few minutes later, a hailstorm lashed the countryside. A few hours after that, there was a driving snowstorm. Since the weather had been fairly spring-like for the previous couple of weeks, the odd climatic goings-on prompted one soldier to exclaim, Gee, do you suppose he really is God, after all? Forty-six millions of Americans hardly doubted it. Richard H. Rovier and Arthur M. Schlesinger, Jr., wrote, It is doubtful if there has ever been in this country so violent and spontaneous a discharge of political passion as that provoked by the President's dismissal of the General. Certainly there has been nothing to match it since the Civil War.
not until the death of President Kennedy would the nation experience so profound a simultaneous experience. The citizen, Rovere and Schlesinger observed, was on MacArthur's side. His private emotions had been deeply engaged. Speaking on short notice, Truman told a nationwide radio audience that he had had no choice, that he had acted with the deepest personal regret. Walter Ayuther rallied to his defense, so did the American Veterans Committee, the AMVITS, Joseph Curran of the National Maritime Union, and ad hoc committees at Harvard and Princeton. Eisenhower told reporters, when you put on a uniform there are certain inhibitions you accept thereby widening the gulf between him and his former chief, but that was not the majority view. The White House mail room was swamped with protests. Short's office ruefully conceded that in the first 27,363 letters and telegrams, those critical of the recall outnumbered those who supported it 20 to 1, the percentage held until they passed the 78,000 mark, when Short's staff stopped counting. George Gallup found that 69% of the voters back MacArthur. Appearing at Griffith Stadium, Truman was booed, the first public booing of a president since 1932. Short announced that the chief executive had cancelled a scheduled speech so as not to detract from the general's return. Then the White House leaked Miss Anderson's wake transcript to the press. 47 in Seattle, an enraged logger tried to drown a friend in a bucket of beer for taking Truman's side. A southern senator said, The people in my part of the country are almost hysterical. So were the people in other parts of the country. Improvised bumper stickers read, oust President Truman. Flags were flown upside down or at half-mast from East Ham, Massachusetts, to Oakland, California. In San Gabriel, California, the president was burned in effigy, Ponca City, Oklahoma, burned an effigy of Aixon. Petitions were circulated. Clergymen fulminated in their pulpits. New anti-Truman jokes were heard, this wouldn't have happened if Truman were alive and I'm going to have a Truman beer, just like any other beer except that it hasn't got a head. In Atlanta, a veteran wrapped his bronze star and sent it back to Washington. The VFW wired the general, asking him to lead a loyalty parade in Philadelphia. A Hollywood producer offered him $3,000 a week to star in The Square Needle, a movie about a commander being persecuted by politicians. The minute women of Baltimore organized a march on the Capitol. In New York, Irishmen who had been picketing the British consulate for two years set aside their anglophobic signs for pro MacArthur sandwich boards. The American Legion and the student body of Boston College went on record as backing the general. A Denver man founded a Punch Harry in the Nose Club. In Los Angeles, a husband and wife wound up in jail cells after belting each other over the dismissal. 48 workmen in Lafayette, Indiana, carrying impeach Truman placards, paraded two miles through a rainstorm to a telegraph office to send the White House angry telegrams. A Houston clergyman dialed Western Union to dictate similar sentiments, spluttered, Your removal of General MacArthur is a great victory for Joseph Stalin and dropped dead of apoplexy. In Charlestown, Maryland, a woman was told that she couldn't send a wire to the White House calling the president a moron, she and the clerk riffled through a Roger's thesaurus until they found the acceptable whittling. If the addressee was not Truman, Western Union offices were more permissive. Among the telegrams from constituents inserted in the congressional record by their representatives on the Hill were impeach the imbecile, we wish to protest the latest outrage on the part of the pig in the White House, impeach the Judas in the White House WHO sold the United States down the river to the left wingers and the UN, suggest you look for another hiss in Blair House, when an ex-National Guard captain fires a five-star general impeachment of the National Guard captain is in order, Impeach the BWHO calls himself president, impeach the little ward politician stupidity from Kansas City, and impeach the red herring from the presidential chair. 49 The firestorm also licked at the portals of local governments.
The Los Angeles City Council adjourned in sorrowful contemplation of the political assassination of MacArthur. The California, Florida, and Michigan legislatures censured Truman. The Illinois Senate expressed shock that the administration had struck down an enemy of totalitarianism and resolved that we express our unqualified confidence in General MacArthur and vigorously condemned the irresponsible and capricious action of the president in summarily discharging him from command and that we further condemn such action without an opportunity to General MacArthur and others of his command to inform the people of our nation of the true condition of affairs in Korea and the Far East and be it further resolved, that we further criticize and condemn the policies of the present administration for withholding information, if any exists, to justify this action. The working press, for neither the first nor the last time, disagreed with most newspaper readers. By better than six to one, correspondents covering the story told a Saturday Review surveyor that they thought the president's move was justified. But most of them said he had handled it badly, and 15% thought the dismissal had harmed the United States prestige abroad. The midnight ride of Harry Truman, one said, made us look like a bunch of fools. The Washington Post, the New York Herald Tribune, and the New York Times sided with the president. Arthur Crock called the general an incorrigible egotist, and the Christian Science Monitor said that it had become necessary for MacArthur to conform, to resign or to be removed. There are few principles to which editors hew more steadfastly than civilian control of the military, and among the newspapers which were usually hostile to the administration but championed it in this instance were the Portland Oregonian, the Minneapolis Tribune, the Birmingham News, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, the Chicago Daily News, the Boston Herald, the Denver Post, and the Washington Star. Business Week felt that talk of impeachment proceedings against the president is silly and irresponsible and that there was nothing for the president to do at this late date but to relieve the general. However, Business Week argued, Truman's course of holding on in Korea and, like McCorber, hoping something will turn up is alien to our national experience. The general may not always be easy to deal with, but it is incredible that a policy could not have been worked out months ago. Why was this not done at Wake Island where the President and the General met in what was described as complete harmony? Later, why was MacArthur not ordered home to consult personally with the Joint Chiefs of Staff? 50 That was the gentlest position taken by conservative publications. The press barons of the right, McCormick, Hearst, Luce, David Lawrence, the Scripps Howard editors, took a darker view. The Chicago Tribune anticipating later critics of the Vietnam War, declared, Mr. Truman can be impeached for usurping the power of Congress when he ordered American troops to the Korean front without a declaration of war. Given the provocation to defy the president, Pascom Timmons wrote in the Houston Chronicle, MacArthur's restraint has been admirable. The Daily Oklahoman called the dismissal a crime carried out in the dead of night, overlooking the fact that the dead of night in Oklahoma was broad daylight in Tokyo. Ardently, if inaccurately, the United States News and World Report expressed the feeling that it was intolerable that this fresh blow should be dealt to the man who saw the stars and stripes hauled down in surrender at Bataan at the start of World War II. A New York Journal American editorial suggested that Truman had been drugged. Maybe the State Department gave him some kind of mental or neural anodyne, and Harry H. Schlicht, the paper's poet laureate, was moved to write, We thank thee, Heavenly Father, for General Douglas MacArthur. Nick Kenny, Schlicht's rival on the New York Mirror, composed a ballad which reflected the general's own sentiments, describing arrows bouncing off his breastplate while knives were sunk into his unshielded back. Kenny implored him, great soldier, statesman, diplomat, keep high your shining sword. Adding, in a line apparently meant to rhyme, tis your name that they applaud. Fifty-one Aixons primitives were in full cry. Joseph R. McCarthy charged that treason in the White House had been achieved by men who had plied the president with bourbon and benedictine. William E. Jenner said, this country today is in the hands of a secret coterie which is directed by agents of the Soviet Union.
Congressman Orland K. Armstrong of Missouri called the relief of the general the greatest victory for the communists since the fall of China. Brigadier Julius Klein, military consultant to the Republican National Committee, said the Kremlin ought to fire a 21-gun salute in celebration. The Grand Old Party Policy Committee unanimously approved a statement accusing the Truman Aix and Marshall Triumvirate of planning a super Munich in Asia and asking, as the authors of their decision to abandon China to the communists, do they now presume themselves free to resume the course interrupted by the Korean conflict? 52 One of the shrewdest exploiters of the general's tragedy was Richard M. Nixon. The happiest group in the country? said the freshman senator from California, will be the communists and their stooges. The president has given them what they have always wanted, MacArthur's scalp. MacArthur, he said, had been fired simply because he had the good sense and patriotism to ask that the hands of our fighting men in Korea be untied. The senator then drafted a resolution declaring it to be the sense of the Senate that the President of the United States has not acted in the best interests of the American people in relieving of his commands and depriving the United States of the services of General of the Army Douglas MacArthur and that the President should restore General MacArthur to the commands from which he was removed. In vintage Nixonese he told his senatorial colleagues. Let me say that I am not among those who believe that General MacArthur is infallible. I am not among those who think that he has not made decisions which are subject to criticism. But I do say that in this particular instance he offers an alternative policy which the American people can and will support. He offers a change from the policies which have led us almost to the brink of disaster in Asia. In 24 hours the senator received 600 telegrams commanding him. He said delightedly, it's the largest spontaneous reaction I've ever seen. 53 Truman weathered this storm, but he won no support for his conduct of the war. Neither did MacArthur win it for his more dangerous proposals, even though he left the world scene with applause ringing in his ears and his reputation as a great fighting general intact. It was one thing for Americans to acclaim a hero, to fling down egg hauntlet to the Sino Soviet foe was another matter. Gallup's findings here are instructive. A bare majority approved of blockading China, bombing Manchurian bases, and defending Formosa, but most doubted that Chiang could ever recover the mainland, and only 30% were ready to fight Mao. Less than six years having passed since VJ Day, the voters were in no mood for another Great War. 54 Yet they were clearly disenchanted with the fighting on the peninsula. An impatient people, they had no stomach for a protracted struggle, idealistic to a fault, they would willingly go to war only if the issue was presented to them as a righteous crusade. Anything less smacked of power politics, which they, like their ancestors, despised. MacArthur's contempt for half-measures and the brokered truce, his determination to punish the evil men who had disturbed the peace, peace, in American eyes, being the normal relationship between nations, struck a chord deep within them. His moral challenge, his vow to crush wickedness, appealed to what they regarded as their best instincts. The fact that they could not respond to it saddened, even grieved, them, and they felt untrue to themselves. Tokyo was stricken. After a half decade under Mekasa Genui, Field Marshal MacArthur, the Nipponese were the most prosperous, least troubled people in Asia. They deeply respected MacArthur, Sebald recalls, he had managed with his superb instinct to act with restraint and deftness in the exercise of the unparalleled power of his position. His remoteness, Sebald believes, was often criticized, but not by the Japanese, who understood or respected the need for aloofness. The critics generally were non-Japanese writers and reporters who had no responsibility for the occupation and little understanding of MacArthur's methods of dealing with a unique, sensitive, and alien people. 55 Three months earlier, the people of Kanagawa Prefecture, which includes Yokohama, had commissioned a bronze bust of him with the legend on the base, General Douglas MacArthur, Liberator of Japan. Now Yoshida in a broadcast to the nation, said that the general's accomplishments in Nippon were one of the marvels of history.
it is he who has salvaged our nation from post-surrender confusion and prostration, and steered the country on the road, to reconstruction. It is he who has firmly planted democracy in all segments of our society. It is he who has paved the way for a peace settlement. No wonder he is looked upon by all our people with the profoundest veneration and affection. I have no words to convey the regret of our nation to see him leave. The Diet passed a resolution of gratitude, no take Sato, the President of the House of Councillors, and Kotaro Tanaka, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, wrote the general of their personal anguish, and Hirohito appeared at the embassy, the first time an emperor had called on a foreigner with no official standing. Taking MacArthur's hand in both of his, he told him of his own profound distress. 56 Sebald noted that the general's imminent departure dominated the emotions of Japan and filled the newspapers. The Nippon Times commented that the good wishes of 83 million Japanese people would go with him, that mere words can never describe adequately all that he had meant to this nation. Tokyo's two great dailies joined in the tributes. Mainichi said, MacArthur's dismissal is the greatest shock since the end of the war. He dealt with the Japanese people not as a conqueror but a great reformer. He was a noble political missionary. What he gave us was not material aid and democratic reform alone, but a new way of life, the freedom and dignity of the individual. We shall continue to love and trust him as one of the Americans who best understood Japan's position. Asahi followed, the removal is a great disappointment to the Japanese, especially when a peace settlement is so near. Japan's recovery must be attributed solely to his guidance. We feel as if we had lost a kind and loving father. On the morning he left, Mainichi addressed him directly, we wanted your further help in nurturing our green democracy to fruition. We wanted your leadership at least until a signed peace treaty had given us a send off into the world community. 57 Jean was also praised, as a symbol of the wifely devotion which the Nipponese considered a paramount virtue among women, but at the time she was too busy to read any of the encomiums. Those days, says Huff, were a mad scramble to cram possessions in suitcases and footlockers. Among other things, time had to be found to brief Ridgeway, who had temporarily moved into the Imperial Hotel. Asked, how does it feel to take MacArthur's place? He replied correctly, nobody takes the place of a man like that. You just follow him. The new Supreme Commander, fifteen years younger than his predecessor, gave one observer the impression of boundless energy, restlessness, frankness, and a desire for team action, whereas MacArthur, who rarely consulted anyone before issuing crisp orders, had projected the impression of relaxed confidence. The old general wore faded, often patched khakis, the new one, battle dress, complete with hand grenades hanging from a shoulder strap. MacArthur, the literate aristocrat, had written out all of his statements in longhand. Ridgeway, the technician, delegated such tasks. The first had been a West Point cadet at the time of the Spanish-American War, the second had graduated during World War I. A generational chasm lay between them. 58 Among them, MacArthur last guests was Joe Cho Aid, the California attorney who had been a leader of the 1948 MacArthur for President campaign. Cho Aid pointed out to Bunker that Scap was no longer an appropriate name for the general's constellation. Bunker renamed it Batan, and the fresh paint sparkled in the dawn light of Monday, April 16, 1951, the day of their departure. Those who would bid them farewell gathered on the tarmac shortly after daybreak. It was a silver-gray, chilly, but clear morning, one American wife recalls, and just after we arrived at the field, the sun came up. The motorcade left the embassy at 6.28 a.m. despite the early hour, nearly a quarter million Japanese lined the 12 miles to the airport, standing 10 deep, held in check by 10,000 Nipponese policemen. Huff would later remember the little people, the storekeepers and the farmers and the shop girls for whom MacArthur had created a whole new idea of freedom. They waved small American and Japanese flags, or called out sayonara, sayonara, or held up banners reading we love you, MacArthur, with deep regret, and we are grateful to the general.
59 MacArthur strides toward his plane in Tokyo after President Truman has relieved him Ridgway and Doyle Hickey, SCAP's current chief of staff, formally greeted the general's limousine at Hanada. Then MacArthur relieved the honor guard and he and Jean bade farewell to the Japanese leaders, the diplomatic corps, and senior occupation officials, Sebald, Albert Wedemeyer, C. Turner Joy, and Britain's Sir Horace Robertson. Cannon were booming out a salute, 18 jet fighters and four superfortresses were swooping overhead, but except for the muffled sobbing of Tanaka and the women the scene on the airstrip was oddly silent. The first passenger up the ramp was Archer, dignified in her Cantonese coat and trousers, and everyone heard her when, turning and waving, she cried, Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. As she bowed in all directions, an army band struck up Old Lang Syne. The general, Jean, Arthur, and the others followed the Amma. At 720 story roared down the runway, gathering speed. The crowd, still quiet and aware of the historicity of the event, watched the plane rise, circled the field, head northeastward. They gazed upward until it dwindled to a speck over the Pacific and disappeared. Thus the Andalusians may have felt as they watched Caesar, in trouble with Rome's optimates, leave his proconsular post in Father Spain to travel home and refute the criticism. Like him, MacArthur, returning to Washington after a fourteen-year absence, was journeying from an outpost of empire to the epicenter, the very pivot of his nation's power. But Caesar's age had been fifty, his time had come. MacArthur was thirty years older, his time and that of the values he represented, had irretrievably passed. Sixty during the long flight to Hawaii, Bunker, Canada, the Huffs and the Whitneys read or chatted quietly while Arthur sang to Arche and the general worked on his speech to Congress. Jean sat silently beside him. From time to time he set his pencil aside. Their eyes would meet, and wordlessly they would hold hands. At one point, Worrying that she might become exhausted, he led her to a bunk, took down a blanket from an overhead rack, and spread it over her in his slow, deliberate, old man's way. Then he patted her hand and returned to his manuscript. 61 She was back with him when the baton soared over Diamond Head and glided toward Hickam Field. Below stood a crowd estimated by the New York Times at 100,000. They must be the for you, Jean said. MacArthur said uncertainly, I hope they're not just here because they're feeling sorry for me. They were there, as the Times noted, to give him their heartfelt aloha, lining a 20-mile parade route to the campus of the University of Hawaii, where 3,000 students cheered as President Greg Sinclair awarded him an honorary doctorate of civil law, saying, General MacArthur is one of the great Americans of this age, and in the opinion of many in this group, one of the greatest Americans of all times. 62 Story approached the California coast after sundown, as ordered. The MacArthur went up to the pilot's compartment to glimpse the first shadowy outline of the homeland Arthur had never seen. As San Francisco's lights winked into view, the general put his hands on his son's shoulders and said, Well, my boy, we're home. The plane touched the runway at 8.29 p.m. Story came back to open the door, and the general, as always, called, Good Flight, Crew. Then he stepped out on the ramp. Instantly, his gold-encrusted cap and his dramatic trench coat were bathed in massed spotlights. He said, Mrs. MacArthur and myself have thought and thought of this moment for years, but no one below could hear him. More cannon were firing and somewhere out there in the dark an army band was playing. Presently no one could hear the music, either, over 10,000 San Franciscans had broken through police lines and were surging around the Badan. Among those lost in the turmoil were Governor Earl Warren, who, with the mayor, was waiting to welcome him. It took the general's party 20 minutes to reach the cars. And that was only the beginning. A half million aroused people were in the streets, most of them yelling, many fainting, and all of them, it seemed, blocking the progress of the motorcade. Two hours later, having crawled fourteen miles, 
the MacArthur reached the St. Francis Hotel, where a wedge of cops linked arms to save them from being trampled to death and Arthur, understandably frightened, kept looking to his mother for reassurance. In their suite the MacArthur saw television for the first time, a candy store sent the boy milkshakes of three different flavors, and Archie, to comply with immigration laws, was admitted to the United States as a student. The following morning another half million Californians hurrahed as the returning hero toured the downtown area. At times he was invisible, even to the millions watching on TV, through a downpour of confetti, ticker tape, shredded newspaper, and feathers from pillows torn apart by hysterical fellow guests at the St. Francis. On the steps of City Hall he said, I was just asked if I intend to enter politics. My reply was no. I have no political aspirations whatsoever. I do not intend to run for political office, and I hope that my name will never be used in a political way. The only politics I have is contained in a single phrase known well to all of you. God bless America. 63 That, of course, was precisely what a candidate would have said. Washington could not fathom his intentions, but the capital's leaders were dealers in the currency of popularity. They recognized a political phenomenon when they saw one, and although the general's constellation didn't reach Washington National Airport until after midnight on April 19, and though many there were mourning Arthur Vandenberg, who had died a few hours earlier, another 12,000 were milling around outside the terminal. The Joint Chiefs were on hand to present him with a silver tea service, so was the Secretary of Defense, so was the Congressional leadership, so, it appeared, was everyone except Harry Truman, who had sent his military aide and old National Guard crony, Harry Vaughan, to represent him. None of them were any luckier than Governor Warren. The throng overwhelmed barriers and swept the distinguished greeters aside. MacArthur spent a quarter hour fighting his way to his limousine. Jean and Arthur were briefly separated. Whitney was knocked off his feet. The only men in the eye of the storm to emerge unbruised were the Washington correspondents, who had prudently worn football helmets. 64 hillocks of banked flowers awaited the general in the stateless presidential suite. Putting his wife and son to bed, he sat down at the suite's writing desk to polish his address. By now it had passed through several drafts. Bunker had typed the first in Honolulu, enlisted men in San Francisco had copied subsequent versions. It was in the Stateler, just before dawn that Thursday, that MacArthur wrote the final paragraph. No one knew of that ending until he delivered it but it is possible that Truman may have seen the rest. According to his recollection, he had told Secretary Pace, Frank, you get a copy of that speech and bring it to me. Pace said that it would be very embarrassing, that he would really rather not. The President said, Frank, I don't give a good god damn what you'd rather. I want you to get me that speech and bring it to me on the double. Apparently a Pentagon public relations officer approached the general in San Francisco, telling him that the text would have to be cleared. Whitney writes that MacArthur was almost as angered as he was astonished. He therefore immediately challenged the legality of the directive, at which the Department of the Army quickly backed down, admitting in its apology that the order had been a mistake by one of the department's administrative officials. But Truman told Merle Miller that Pace went and got it and I read it. It was nothing but a bunch of damn bullshit. 65 Actually the commander-in-chief would have been justified in demanding the right to approve MacArthur's remarks. A five-star general could not be formally retired, his salary, those of the officers accompanying him, and the cost of his plane were being funded by the government. And it was clear, as Millis notes that he was about to deliver an attack upon the administration's conduct of a foreign war of a kind not often permitted to top generals just relieved for insubordination to the civil authority. But under the circumstances it was out of the question for Truman, resentful though he was, to order the general around. Therefore he kept his profile low, instructing his staff to make sure that MacArthur received full honors and that schoolchildren and government workers were given a half-holiday to greet him.
expecting the cabinet to attend the joint session would have been too much, however. They would listen to the speech with him in the White House and discuss its impact afterward. At noon, the House of Representatives convened. Jean appeared in the visitors' gallery at 12:13 p.m. and received an ovation. At 12:18, the general's officers escorted Arthur to the well of the House. At 12:20, floodlights were turned on and the senators marched in. The excitement began to build until, at 12:31, the doorkeeper cried. Mr. Speaker, General of the Army Douglas MacArthur. The audience leapt to its feet, shouting, clapping, and thumping desks as MacArthur, erect and impassive, strode down the aisle, mounted the podium, and awaited their attention. As the hall quieted, he said in measured tones, Mr. President, Mr. Speaker, distinguished members of Congress, I stand on this rostrum with a sense of deep humility and great pride humility in the wake of those great American architects of our history who have stood here before me, pride in the reflection that this forum of legislative debate represents human liberty in the purest form yet devised. I address you with neither anchor nor bitterness in the fading twilight of life with but one purpose in mind, to serve my country. 66 They went wild again. And again. And again. Altogether his 34-minute address was interrupted by 30 ovations. It was clear to those hearing him for the first time that he had mastered what entertainers call projection an intimate, one-to-one -one relationship with each member of his audience, which, because of radio and television, exceeded 30 million Americans. They were, life reported, magnetized by the vibrant voice the dramatic rhetoric and the Olympian personality of the most controversial military hero of our times. He kept his hands anchored on the lectern, except when turning pages, only once, in reaching for a tumbler of water, did his right hand tremble. He was lucid, forceful, dignified, and eloquent, though he clearly thought his message urgent, his delivery was unhurried and rhythmic. All his life had been a preparation for this moment. George Kenney, listening on Enoch, remembered watching him hold audiences spellbound before and this was no exception. As always, his profound knowledge of his subject, his clarity of presentation and his undoubted sincerity, held the attention of the listener to the end. He would, he said near the outset, confine his discussion to the general areas of Asia. A swift review of the continent's history followed. He erred once, saying the Chinese warlord Chang Tso Lin came to power at the turn of the century actually it was a quarter century later, but most orientalists were impressed by his grasp of the Far East, particularly his analysis of China's emergence as an aggressive, imperialistic power whose vigorous thrusts were evident not only in Korea, but also in Indochina and Tibet, and pointing potentially toward the south reflecting predominantly the same lust for the expansion of power which has animated every would-be conqueror since the beginning of time. He had no illusions that lofty dreams could solve Asia's problems, what the peoples strive for is the opportunity for a little more food in their stomachs, a little better clothing on their backs, a little firmer roof over their heads, and the realization of the normal nationalist urge for political freedom. These goals, he believed, could best be reached by a United Nations victory in Korea and the restoration of peace. Indeed, since Peking had entered the conflict there had been no other way to achieve them, once war is forced upon us, there is no alternative than to apply every available means to bring it to a swift end. War's very object is victory, not prolonged indecision. And, once again, in war, indeed, there can be no substitute for victory. 67 victory had been within his grasp when the Chinese intervened. This created a new war and an entirely new situation. Which called for new decisions in the diplomatic sphere to permit the realistic adjustment of military strategy. Such decisions have not been forthcoming. He had urged the administration to adopt a realistic course of action. At no time had he contemplated an invasion of Manchuria or any other mainland territory, but the new situation did urgently demand a drastic revision of strategic planning if our political aim was to defeat this new enemy as we had defeated the old. To achieve this, 
he recommended five steps, a recognition of the need to neutralize the sanctuary protection given the enemy north of the Yalu, an intensified economic blockade of the mainland, imposition of a naval blockade, air reconnaissance of China's coastal areas and of Manchuria, and unleashing Chiang for Chinese nationalist raids on the mainland. These were subtly different from those he had urged upon the Joint Chiefs on December 30, there was no mention now of destroying China's industrial capacity to wage war by aerial bombardment and naval gunfire, and none of using KMT reinforcements in Korea. But the substance was the same, and his sincerity was obvious when he said, for entertaining these views, all professionally designed to support our forces and bring hostilities to an end. At a saving of countless American and allied lives, I have been severely criticized in lay circles, principally a broad day to get the British, and despite my understanding that from a military standpoint the above views have been fully shared in the past by practically every military leader concerned with the Korean campaign, including our own Joint Chiefs of Staff. 68 That brought a standing ovation. It was untrue and the chiefs would later say so, but MacArthur could never bring himself to recognize that members of his own profession opposed his program. He was convinced that they had been cowed by the administration, and he may have been right, though they strenuously denied it. The fact is that they were cautious and he was incautious, throughout his career that had been the key to his successes as well as his failures, that was why his reputation had eclipsed theirs why he was addressing Congress from a podium normally reserved for chiefs of state. All his life he had been a daring officer, an advocate of aggressive action, and now he told his listeners why, history teaches with unmistakable emphasis that appeasement but begets new and bloodier war. It points to no single instance where the end has justified that means, where appeasement has led to more than a sham peace. Like blackmail, it lays the basis for new and successively greater demands, until, as in blackmail, violence becomes the only other alternative. Why, my soldiers asked of me, surrender military advantages to an enemy in the field. He paused histrionically, and his voice dropped to a husky whisper, I could not answer. MacArthur addresses joint session of Congress, April 1951 MacArthur, Arthur IV, and Jean after the speech to Congress he praised your fighting sons, reporting that they are splendid in every way. Those gallant men will remain often in my thoughts and in my prayers always. Then, in words few would forget, he said, I am closing my fifty-two years of military service. When I joined the army, even before the turn of the century, it was the fulfillment of all my boyish hopes and dreams. The world has turned over many times since I took the oath on the plane at West Point, and the hopes and dreams have long since vanished. But I still remember the refrain of one of the most popular barrack ballads of that day, which proclaimed, most proudly, that old soldiers never die. They just fade away. And like the soldier of the ballad, I now close my military career and just fade away. An old soldier who tried to do his duty as God gave him the light to see that duty. The last word was a hush, goodbye. 69 He handed his manuscript to the clerk, waved to Jean, and stepped down into pandemonium. The legislators were sobbing their praise, struggling to touch his sleeve, all but prostrating themselves in his path. Representative Dewey Short shouted, We heard God speak here today. God in the flesh, the voice of God. A senator said, it's disloyal not to agree with General MacArthur. With few exceptions, their constituents, glued to television screens or intent by radios, were equally moved. In New York Herbert Hoover called MacArthur a reincarnation of St. Paul into a great general of the army who came out of the East. Cheeks were wet, voices hoarse, chests heaving. When it was over, said Kenny, you had the feeling that everyone took a deep breath, that they had forgotten to breathe as they didn't want to miss any of his words. Senator James Duff of Pennsylvania said that the entire country was on a great emotional binge. Americans were phoning their newspapers, 
demanding that they defy the bankrupt haberdasher and the traitorous State Department which planned to sell us down the river to Great Britain, Europe, and the Communists. One woman in New Jersey, agreeing with Short and Hoover, said that the general had the attributes of God, he is kind and merciful and firm and just. That is my idea of God. 70 These calls were coming into the White House, too, where the President and his advisors were still gathered around a television set in the West Wing. The cabinet, with the exception of Ixon, was appalled, wondering whether the administration had been dealt a mortal blow. The sardonic Secretary of State reassured them. He thought the address more than somewhat pathetic, it reminded him, he said, of the father who had zealously guarded his daughter's chastity and who, when she announced she was pregnant, threw up his hands and cried, thank heaven it's over. Truman, less elegant, felt that his opinion of the speech had been confirmed, for all the carrying on and the damn fool congressman crying like a bunch of women, it was, the president said, a hundred percent bullshit. Congress was still drying its eyes when MacArthur rode down Pennsylvania Avenue under an umbrella of Air Force jets. Over 500,000 Washingtonians cheered him that afternoon, half of them in one rumbling mass around the Washington Monument. There he received the official key to the city while Arthur was being given a necktie with the MacArthur tartan and a watch which told him the time, the day, the month, the year, and the phases of the moon. Then the general entered Constitution Hall for a few remarks to 6,000 daughters of the American Revolution, meeting in the DAR's 60th Continental Congress. The ladies had voted to remove their hats so they wouldn't obscure one another's view of him, and he didn't disappoint them. I have long sought personally to pay you the tribute that is in my heart, he said. In this hour of crisis, all patriots look to you. Striking a note which he would repeat before other conservative groups, he said, the complexities and confusion, resulting largely from internal subversion and corruption and detailed regimentation over our daily lives, now threaten the country no less than it was threatened in Washington's day. Under these harmful influences, we have drifted far away. From the simple but immutable pattern etched by our forefathers. Reading her minutes the next day. The DA Recording Secretary General, Mrs. Warren Shattuck Courier, observed that the General's speech was probably the most important event in the history of the hall. Instantly Mrs. Thomas B. Throckmorton was on her feet. She moved, and the convention unanimously agreed, to strike the word probably. 71 by then MacArthur was in New York. Once more he had arrived late in the evening and once more the mob was enormous but this time he was in a city with vast experience in welcoming celebrities. At Idlewild he was met by Manhattan's official greeter, Grover Whalen, who had probably shaken more famous hands than anyone in history, and the ten members of the city police department's Bureau of Special Service and Investigation, who led him to their special dignitary car, the two-tone Chrysler bearing the famous license plate 4C2602 the same vehicle which had carried Eisenhower through the city upon his triumphant return from Europe. Already these bodyguards knew that the turnout for MacArthur was going to be larger than Nike's. Louis Sullivan, who was one of them, recalls that despite the fact that the official parade wasn't scheduled until the next day, there were already people perched in trees, on ledges, and on rooftops, many screaming, give em hell, and don't take it. When the MacArthur checked in at the Waldorf Astoria, 150,000 letters and 20,000 telegrams awaited them, with more, an aide remembers, pouring in by the sackload. 72 in the morning MacArthur entered the Chrysler with Whitney and Mayor Vincent P. Impellatory, the bodyguards stood on the running boards of the backup car, and Jean, Arthur, and the mayor's wife were in the third limousine. Nearly seven hours were required to cover the 19.2-mile motorcade route, every foot of curbing was occupied by bellowing humanity. Manhattan had never seen anything to equal it. It roared and shrilled itself to near exhaustion, the Times reported next day, the metropolis formed a gigantic cheering section rocketing its shouts of approval for the 71-year-old soldier statesman. The crowd numbered several million, 
the largest the city had ever seen, 40,000 longshoremen, among others, had walked off their jobs to be there. Factory sirens were tied down, ocean liners honked deeply, tooting fireboats spouted water, and aviators overhead spelled out welcome home and well done in celestial messages over a mile long. 73 The general left the convertible twice, once to pump the hand of Francis Cardinal Spellman, who was standing in his red robes outside St. Patrick's Cathedral, and once at City Hall, to tell 60,000 New Yorkers. 18 of whom were later hospitalized with nervous exhaustion, we do surrender. Fifth Avenue, Sullivan recalls, was like a herd of hysterical sheep. Women were weeping into handkerchiefs, men were crossing themselves, children were holding up banners and placards reading, MacArthur will never fade out, welcome home, MacArthur, and God save us from Aixon. After it was all over the Department of Sanitation reported that over 2,859 tons of litter had been dumped on the general, four times Eisenhower's record. 74 entrepreneurs who had cashed in on MacArthur's fame in 1942 were prospering again. Long-stemmed corn cob pipes, Toby jugs bearing the general's image, and MacArthur souvenirs of every description had been rushed through production lines. Enterprising notions vendors were selling MacArthur buttons, pennants, and corn cobs left over from the 1948 MacArthur for President campaign. Florists were offering a Douglas MacArthur tea rose, needs no coddling or favor, and MacArthur orchids, cacti, gladioli, geraniums, peonies, and irises. Jewelers sold brooches with gems arranged to resemble the general's profile while tunesmiths on Tinpan Alley were turning out five recordings of Old Soldiers Never Die, Never Die, Never Die, Old Soldiers Never Die, They Just Fade Away. Obviously this soldier was not going to disappear soon. At the Waldorf Towers, where the MacArthur moved into Suite 37A, switchboard operators began logging 3,000 calls a day from people who wanted to speak to him. Presents for Arthur began to pile up a racing bicycle from California, and, from Leo Duracha, a New York Giants cap, a mitt, a Giants windbreaker, and two autographed baseballs. Arthur's father, meanwhile, had paid his respects to Hoover and then settled back like a medieval lord to receive his vassals. Among those who came were Spellman, Luce, Hurst, Colonel McCormick, and a delegation of Republican senators led by Taft and Bridges. This naturally intensified speculation that the general, his San Francisco disclaimer notwithstanding, was about to enter politics. Reporters asked Whitney about it. He said the general wished them to consult John 20 2029. There they found the tale of Doubting Thomas, the apostolic skeptic who refused to credit the resurrection except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side and to whom Jesus said, after showing him these wounds, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed, blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. 75 One doubting Thomas on Capitol Hill was Georgia's powerful Senator Richard Russell. On May 3, 1951, his gavel opened a joint inquiry of the Upper House's Foreign Relations and Armed Services Committees in the Senate Office Building. Their instructions from their colleagues were to investigate MacArthur's relief and the military situation in the Far East, but in reality the hearings, held in the marble-paneled, high-ceilinged caucus room, the scene of all first-class Senate meetings, were a contest between the two parties. The twenty-five senators split along factional lines over the question of whether or not their meetings should be open to the press, the Republicans favored it, while the Democrats, time reported, were determined to keep General MacArthur's thundering rhetoric out of earshot of the microphones and his dramatic profile off the screens of 12 million television sets. In the end the committeemen compromised, the press would be excluded, but correspondents would be given transcripts after a Navy flag officer had deleted sensitive information which he thought the public should not have. 76 Russell, a loyal Democrat who mistrusted the general's hawkishness, Nevertheless won his confidence by describing him as one of the great captains of history. 
whose broad understanding and knowledge of the science of politics has enabled him to restore and stabilize a conquered country and win for himself and his country the respect and affection of a people who were once our bitterest enemies. The chairman overwhelmed those who had predicted a quick whitewash by the sheer volume of the testimony taken, 2,450,000 words from 13 witnesses in 42 days. Never before in the history of Western parliaments, said time, has there been an examination of fundamentals so painstaking in detail, so sweeping in scale. Most deservedly, Russell earned the gratitude of his president, who wrote that his skillful handling of the MacArthur Committee hearing demonstrated his ability, wisdom, and judicious temperament as a chairman. Truman especially appreciated the senator's sympathy for his conviction that there are times when the executive must decline to supply Congress with information, and that is when he feels the Congress encroaches upon the executive prerogatives. For the sole purpose of embarrassing the president, in other words, for partisan political reasons. Each time the administration declined to submit material on these grounds, Russell deferred to the necessities of national security. New York's ticker tape parade for the MacArthur on Thursday, May 3, while Jean waded through mountains of mail and Arthur went to a ball game clutching a fielder's glove from Jody Maggio, MacArthur flew to the Capitol for the committee's first session. His testimony, he said, would be his final official act. He had no prepared statement, he told the senators. My comments were made fully when I was so signally honored by the Congress in inviting me to appear before them. I appear today not as a voluntary witness at all, but in response to the request of the committee, and I am entirely in the hands of the committee. In fact, he turned out to be not only cooperative but loquacious. Slouching comfortably in a straight-backed chair, puffing on an old briar pipe, his simple blouse bereft of ribbons, he testified for three full days, flying back to the Waldorf each evening. At his suggestion, senators took no lunch break, sandwiches and coffee were brought by messengers. The general didn't even leave for the toilet. A Democratic member said, I don't believe MacArthur is 71 years old. Why, he must have the bladder of a college boy. 77 each morning he greeted reporters outside the caucus room with a casual half wave, half salute. They noticed that he carried no briefcase, that he needed neither documents nor notes. Speaking extemporaneously, he gave the senators, one observer wrote, a vivid display of his historical knowledge, culture, passionate sincerity, vision, and cogency. A single question would touch off a 10 or 15 minute performance in free association, during which he might cite the Caesars, medieval customs, the Magna Carta, the French Revolution. England's 19th century corn laws, Ireland's potato famines, and the average daily caloric consumption of Japanese farmers. Despite the hopes of the Republicans and the fears of the Democrats, he passed up opportunities to criticize the Joint Chiefs or Truman, though he was saving a knife for Marshall, and he wasn't even jolted when Brian McMahon of Connecticut quoted a statement he had made in the early 1930s, affirming the need for presidents, not generals, to determine military strategy. MacArthur genially said that he was surprised and amazed how wise I was. At the end of the third day a senator congratulated him on the vastness of your patience and the thoughtfulness and frankness with which you have answered all the questions. He had been courteous, but his views were unchanged. In a colloquy with Leverett Saltonstall, he said that the theory of finite war introduced a new concept into military operations. His own concept was that when you go into war, you have exhausted all other potentialities of bringing the disagreements to an end. If he understood the State Department's position, it proposed a continued and indefinite campaign in Korea, with no definite purpose of stopping it until the enemy gets tired or you yield to his terms, and that introduced into the military sphere a political control such as I have not known in my life or ever studied. But he didn't really believe the administration's design was that coherent. At one point his voice rose as he protested. The inertia that exists. There is no policy, there is nothing, I tell you. 
no plan, or anything. He asked whether the United States could continue to fight in this accordion fashion, up and down, which means that your cumulative losses are going to be staggering. It isn't just dust that is settling in Korea, Senator, he said, giving Ixon the back of his hand, it is American blood. 78 His differences with the politicians, as he described his civilian superiors, lay in several areas. Unlike the advocates of collective security and like the nationalists who had become his camp followers, MacArthur distrusted the Europeans. Washington's reluctance to offend them, he said, allowed the weaker members of the alliance to dictate the American policy, if one nation carries 90% of the effort, it's quite inappropriate that nations that carry only a small fraction of the efforts and the responsibility should exercise undue authority upon the decisions that are made. Senator Theodore F. Green of Rhode Island asked what would happen if the other UN governments with troops in Korea objected adamantly to an aggressive American strategy. MacArthur, my hope would be of course that the United Nations would see the wisdom and utility of that course, but if they did not I still believe that the interest of the United States being the predominant one in Korea would require our action. Green, alone? MacArthur, alone, if necessary. If the other nations of the world haven't got enough sense to see where appeasement leads after the appeasement which led to the Second World War in Europe, if they can't see exactly the road that they are following in Asia, why then we had better protect ourselves and go it alone. 79 The general was not an isolationist, unlike his congressional supporters, he enthusiastically endorsed economic aid to the emerging nations, but he returned again to the idea, unacceptable to him that war can be applied in a piecemeal way, that you can make half war, not whole war. He explained, when you say, merely, we are going to fight aggression, that is not what the enemy is fighting for. The enemy is fighting for a very definite purpose, to destroy our forces in Korea. He told one senator, you are a bridge player. You know that the first rule in bridge is to lead from your strength. He said, I have seen, I guess as much blood and disaster as any living man, and it just curdled my stomach the last time I was there. After I looked at that wreckage, and those thousands of women and children and everything, I just vomited. That was why he couldn't bear to see it drag on indecisively. Even defeat was preferable, now there are only three ways that I can think of, as I said this morning. Either pursue it to victory to surrender to the enemy and end it on his terms, or what I think is the worst of all choices, to go on indefinitely and indefinitely, neither to win nor lose, in that stalemate, because what we are doing is sacrificing thousands of men while we are doing it. 83 Views of MacArthur During Senate hearings on his recall he urged the committee to adopt four goals, to clear out all North Korea, to unify it and liberalize it to cripple and largely neutralize China's capacity to wage aggressive war, to spread the ideal of democracy evangelically throughout Asia, and to thereby safeguard the peace of Europe, which would inevitably be strengthened because the issue in Korea was global. So interlocked were the stakes there and those on the continent that to consider the problems of one sector oblivious to those of another is but to court disaster for the whole, while Asia is commonly referred to as the gateway of Europe. It is no less true that Europe is the gateway to Asia, and the broad influence of one cannot fail to have its impact on the other. As he saw it, Korea was the right war at the right place at the right time with the right enemy, the most populous, aggressive, and imperialistic power in the world. If Peking wasn't stopped in the Peninsula War, he argued, China would be recognized as the military colossus of the East. The United States' prestige would plummet and the world's new nations would gravitate toward neutralism. They would not understand, as he did not, why the United States did not press all its advantages, including the availability of the Gymo's friendly, eager army on Formosa. Russell, I did not understand exactly what you would have done about the nationalist troops. MacArthur, there was a concentration of red Chinese troops on the mainland which threatened Formosa seriously. I recommended to Washington that the wraps be taken off the Generalissimo, 
the slightest use that was made of those troops would have taken the pressure off my troops. 81 at times the general now sounded like what Senator J. William Fulbright later described as a modern ideological crusader against communism. There could be, he said, no compromise with atheistic communism, no halfway in the preservation of freedom and religion. It must be all or nothing. He accused the administration leaders of being willing to take that stand in Europe but not in Asia. Their preoccupation with the continent amounted to North Atlantic isolationism. He said, I believe we should defend every place from communism. I believe we can. I believe we are able to. I have confidence in us. I don't believe we should write off anything and accept the defeat that is involved in it. Point 1 Don't admit that we can't hold communism wherever it shows its head. He observed that there are those who claim our strength is inadequate to protect us on two fronts. I can think of no greater expression of defeatism. Here he seemed to be at odds with his Republican backers, who felt, as Hoover had put it, that we must not overcommit this country. There is a definite limit to what we can do. The general recognized that the course he advocated might lead to a wider war, but he told McMahon, everything that is involved in international relationships, Senator, amounts to a gamble, risk. You have to take risks. 82 Despite administration views to the contrary, however, he deemed the chances of Soviet intervention to be slight. Moscow had not sufficiently associated itself with the Peninsular War to believe that the defeat of Red China to the extent of her being forced to evacuate Korea would necessarily produce a great prejudice to the Soviet cause in other parts of the world. Nor did he think it within the capacity of the Soviets to mass any great additional increment of force to launch any predatory attack from the Asian continent. Petroleum reservoirs and maintenance facilities in Siberia were inadequate. Russian dispositions in the vicinity of Korea were largely defensive. The Soviets knew they were no match for the United States naval and air power in the Far East. Moreover, their stockpile of nuclear weapons was inferior to America's, if the United States had to fight them, now would be better than later. In a subsequent letter to Senator Harry F. Byrd, the general enlarged on this theme, raising the indeterminate question as to whether the Soviets contemplate world conquest. If it, sick, does, the time and place will be at its initiative and could not fail to be influenced by the fact that in the atomic area the lead of the United States is being diminished with the passage of time. So, likewise, is the great industrial potential of the United States. In short, it has always been my belief that any action we might take to resolve the Far Eastern problem now would not in itself be a controlling factor in the precipitation of the world conflict. 83 But the senators knew that if the Soviet Union was militarily unprepared for a final confrontation, as it was, the Russians did not even begin to develop a long-range bomber fleet until 1954. The United States was psychologically unprepared to risk provocation of the world's other superpower. Among themselves the committee members agreed that MacArthur's bold proposals were therefore unrealistic. They also recalled that he had been fallible in the past, until the very eve of the Japanese attack in 1941, he had insisted that they wouldn't attack the Philippines until the following spring. Furthermore, they noted certain inconsistencies in his testimony. Only a madman, he said, would land American infantrymen in China, anyone who advocates that should have his head examined yet that was inherent in the policies he was urging upon them. In explaining why he had not anticipated Peking's intervention in Korea, he rightly said that that had been the job of political intelligence, but he wrongly refused to accept the warning of the State Department intelligence teams that the Russians might come in, too. And although he proposed a global strategy to resist what was then called the communist conspiracy, he refused to be drawn into discussions of that strategy's implications McMahon, General, where is the source and brains of this conspiracy? MacArthur, how would I know? McMahon, would you think that the Kremlin was the place that might be the loci? MacArthur, I might say that is one of the loci. 84 the senator pressed him, if we go into all-out war. I want to find out how you propose in your own mind to defend the American nation against that war.
The general replied, that doesn't happen to be my responsibility, Senator. My responsibilities were in the Pacific. Worldwide military policy, he said, was the task for the Joint Chiefs. Did he know, he was asked, how many nuclear bombs the United States had? He did not. How many the Russians had? No. McMahon asked, do you think that we are ready to withstand the Russian attack in Western Europe today? MacArthur answered, Senator, I have asked you several times not to involve me in anything except my own area. He said he was not familiar with the chief's European studies, that he had been desperately occupied on the other side of the world. That, McMahon said, was the nub of the issue. The Joint Chiefs and the President of the United States, the Commander-in-Chief, has, sick, to look at this thing on a global basis and a global defense. You as a theater commander by your own statement have not made that kind of study, and yet you advise to push forward with a course of action that may involve us in that global conflict. 85 MacArthur, the senator was saying, couldn't have it both ways. If he persisted in looking at the Far East in the context of the international situation, fitting the Korean peace into the larger puzzle, then he was obliged to recognize the ramifications of that Olympian view. His description of George Marshall's China policy as the greatest political mistake we made in a hundred years, one we will pay for. For a century was a rapier thrust, but unacceptable unless he was prepared to couple his own Asian proposals with others for Europe. Marshall's own inconsistencies, he accused MacArthur of sabotaging GI morale and trying to wreck administration plans for Asia, yet he himself did not fly to Tokyo for a first-hand look at the Korean situation until MacArthur was settled in the Waldorf, do not vindicate MacArthur here. Nevertheless, the senators were stunned and mute when he asked them, what are you going to do to stop the slaughter in Korea? Are you going to let it go on? Does your global plan for defending these United States against war consist of permitting war indefinitely to go on in the Pacific? 86 Truman, who knew that his cause had been hurt, privately called the general a common coward for leaving Corregidor in 1942. He later told Merle Miller, Marshall gave me a rundown on MacArthur that was the best I ever did here. He said he never was any damn good, and he said he was a four-flusher and no two ways about it. Probably that paraphrase of Marshall was accurate, something deep in each five star general raged at something deep in the other. They represented two conflicting streams of American thought. One looked across the Atlantic, the other to the Pacific, one counseled prudence, the other daring, one, like Wellington, believed in coalition warfare, the other, like Napoleon, thought that reliance on allies, though sometimes necessary, was dangerous. Give me allies as an enemy, Bonaparte had said, so I can defeat them one by one. An observer of the Russell hearings compared the Secretary of Defense to a busy schoolmaster attempting to educate his refractory pupils, while the former scap resembled a visiting lecturer determined to convince his audience by an appeal to sentiment. MacArthur had hoped to breach the walls with dynamite, Marshall, with greater cunning breached the walls with the slow prodding of a battering ram. Administration witnesses took seven weeks to rebut MacArthur. It was a major effort for both the Pentagon and the State Department. What is challenged, said Aikson, is the very bedrock purpose of our foreign policy. In his first public counterattack on the general's testimony, Truman said, we are right now in the midst of a big debate on foreign policy. A lot of people are looking at this debate as if it were just a political fight. But, the thing that is at stake in this debate may be atomic war. It is a matter of life or death. At one point Exxon testified, if anything is important, if anything is true about the situation in Korea, it is the overwhelming importance of not forcing a showdown on our side in Korea and not permitting our opponents to force a showdown. This was the whole heart and essence of the policy which the administration has been following. 87 to MacArthur, limited war, the acceptance of prolonged, indecisive conflicts on the peripheries of the Sino-Russian sphere of influence, was like limited pregnancy, but it was the keystone of containment to its architect, George Kennan, 
who defined it as the adroit and vigilant application of counterforce at a series of constantly shifting geographical and political points, corresponding to the shifts and maneuvers of Soviet policy. Kennan wrote, The dimness of our vision gives us the right neither to a total optimism nor to a total pessimism. Our duty to ourselves and to the hopes of mankind lies in avoiding, like the soul of evil itself, that final bit of impatience which tells us to yield the last positions of help before we have been pressed from them by an answerable force. Bradley echoed Kennan when he testified that Korea was just one engagement, just one phase in an endless fight and not, as MacArthur saw it, the culmination of the struggle between East and West. At another point Bradley said, I would not be a proponent of a policy which would ignore the military facts and rush us headlong into a showdown before we are ready. Those military facts, the chiefs told the committee, had been misrepresented by MacArthur. They said the Russians had been building up their munitions industries in Siberia, and the enemy now had many thousands of planes in the vicinity of Vladivostok, Port Arthur, Harbin, and Sakhalin. Chiang's troops were described as having very limited capabilities, particularly for offensive action, in any wider war with China, the JCS chairman said. GIs would have to bear the brunt of the fighting. Bradley believed a decision could not be reached without subjugating the entire Chinese mainland. And that, he said, MacArthur to the contrary, might bring the Russians in. Aixen said he could not accept the assumption that the Soviet Union will go its way regardless of what we do. I do not think that Russian policy is formed that way any more than our policy is formed that way. Moscow and Peking were bound by treaty he pointed out, but even if this treaty did not exist, China is the Soviet Union's largest and most important satellite. Russian self-interest in the Far East and the necessity of maintaining prestige in the communist sphere make it difficult to see how the Soviet Union could ignore a direct attack upon the Chinese mainland. 88 The Secretary of State noted that America's UN allies were understandably reluctant to be drawn into a general war in the Far East one which holds the possibilities of becoming a world war, particularly if it developed out of an American impatience with the progress of the effort to repel aggression. There was, he said, no chance of allied cooperation in a blockade of the mainland. McMahon asked Marshall whether he thought these allies essential to the defense of the United States, and the Secretary of Defense replied, I would think so absolutely, sir, and that is the principle of collective security which is the only principle we think can carry us to peace. One by one, officers who admired MacArthur seated themselves before the senators and sadly rejected his program for victory. Sherman said, definitely, in the short term, time is on our side. Without allied cooperation, the admiral said, a blockade would be ineffective, and he met the Atlantic versus Pacific issue head on, I believe that if we lose Western Europe, we would have an increasingly difficult time in holding our own, whereas if we lost all of the Asiatic mainland, we could still survive and build up and possibly get it back again. Wedimaya saw Korea as the enemy's third team opposing our first team, with the first team absorbing 80% of America's military might. Hoyt Vandenberg described MacArthur's bombing proposals as pecking at the periphery. He explained that the Air Force could lay waste, too. Manchuria and, their, principal cities of China, but, the attrition that would inevitably be brought about upon us would leave us, in my opinion, as a nation, naked for several years to come. In addition, he said, abandoning allies would mean abandonment of invaluable the United States air bases in Europe and North Africa. Collins, MacArthur's most vehement critic in the Pentagon, thought his Thanksgiving deployment of his forces had threatened their survival, and that taking his hard line now would require considerably more the United States troops, a prospect which lengthened senatorial faces. 89 Against this array of fact and expertise, the general's Republican defenders had little to offer but a welter of party loyalty and conservative intuition. I have long approved of General MacArthur's program, Taft said in April, and a grand old party congressman said, some day we will have to fight Red China on her terms at a time of her choosing. She will have atomic power backed by the entire Eurasian land mass.
this issue could have been resolved forever in our favor. Had those in Washington had the foresight to give MacArthur the green light in Asia. Wherry, Bridges, Noland, Nixon, Pkhikin Lopper, Eugene Milliken, Homer Ferguson, Homer Capehart, Everett Dirksen, John Marshall Butler, and Alexander Wiley similarly fell into line. At one point in the hearings Wiley humbly asked MacArthur, do you know of any man in America that has had the vast experience that you have had in the Orient? Dot. Do you know of any other man that has lived there so long, or known the various factors and various backgrounds of the people, and their philosophy, as yourself? The general reflected a moment and then said he didn't. Their press agents, Hearst, McCormick, Luce, and the others, echoed them, life, for example, scorning the pernicious fallacy. The pap of coexistence with Soviet communism. 90 Winston Churchill, recognizing the partisan nature of the split on Capitol Hill and sympathizing with American resentment of what Taft called this foreign mess, counseled Europeans to pay their respects to a great soldier and great statesman and abstain from further comment on the MacArthur uproar. They balked, however, and rightly so for what seemed to be of the United States domestic squabble had grave implications for them and, indeed, for the next generation. Whether that generation was well served is, at best, moot. At the time it seemed that the views of Truman, Aixon, and Marshall had prevailed. But the price they paid was exorbitant. Even before the dismissal of MacArthur, the administration's fear of being called soft on communism had straightjacketed it in the Far East. Almost certainly, we now know, it was the UN's decision to cross the 38th parallel, not MacArthur's end the war offensive, which brought the Chinese into the war. Truman and Dixon had urged Lake's success to take this step because they knew how vulnerable they were, as Walter Lippmann put it, to attack from the whole right wing of the Republican Party. They didn't dare negotiate with Peking, or even modify their stance. To demonstrate their anti communist zeal, they baited Mao, sent mountains of military equipment to Formosa, praised Chiang Asia's hope, and, in the end, even encouraged uprisings on the mainland, insurgent attacks which the State Department knew would never be mounted, and could not have succeeded anyway. This lamentable response to the grand old party indictment did not satisfy their critics and the Senate hearings justifying the sack of MacArthur robbed the administration of one of its most valuable blue chips, the Joint Chief's reputation for impartiality. Eisenhower cheerfully told C. L. Salzberger that the Senate's investigation has served one very useful purpose, it has certainly proved to the Russians that we are not arming with aggressive intentions. But it also proved that the Pentagon was willing to use its clout against Republican critics. While testimony was still being taken, Taft said bluntly that he had lost all confidence in Bradley's military judgment. Lippmann noted the beginning of an almost intolerable thing in a republic, namely a schism within the armed forces between the generals of the Democratic Party and the generals of the Republican Party. The result, he wrote, will considerably weaken civilian control and presidential direction of foreign policy. 91 The Russell Committee's report was for the most part an exercise in pusillanimity. On a motion by Salt and Stall, the members voted 20 to 3 to transmit the records of their hearings to the full Senate without comment. Eight Republican members filed a report describing the United States foreign policy in the Far East as catastrophic. Salt and Stahl said he didn't share MacArthur's views but disapproved the way he had been dismissed. Henry Cabot Lodge also opposed a wider war but thought the general should have been kept in Tokyo until the signing of the U.S. Japanese Peace Treaty. Only Wayne Morse commended the administration's handling of MacArthur. Truman's supporters in the Washington Press Corps, where he retained his popularity, agreed with Morse. Rovere and Schlesinger probably spoke for most liberal journalists when they wrote, the MacArthur challenge did not overthrow the Far Eastern policy nor did it even deepen the discredit into which it had already fallen. It did demonstrate beyond any doubt that the situation was so uncertain and confused that there was no sure footing, nor obvious path out of the morass.
The administration path seemed no more helpless or idiotic or wicked than any of the others, it made more sense, perhaps, than most. They recommended selective containment, which, they felt, seems well within the limits of our capabilities. 92 But asking men to die for uncertainty and confusion is not good enough, and Bradley, aware of it, had tried to come up with a better answer to the terrible questions MacArthur was raising. American lives in the peninsula struggle had not, he argued, been sacrificed in vain. In his testimony the chairman of the Joint Chiefs had declared, the operation in Korea has been a success. The enemy's goal, to drive the United Nations forces out of Korea, had been thwarted. GIs and their allies had checked the communist advance and turned it into a retreat. Their victory has dealt communist imperialism a severe setback. Nor were the accomplishments simply negative, instead of weakening the rest of the world, they have solidified it. They have given a more powerful impetus to the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. The Pentagon had doubled the number of men under arms for future wars. Most important, the idea of collective security has been put to the test, and has been sustained. The nations who believe in collective security have shown that they can stick together and fight together. If the United States entered another such struggle, he said, its men would not stand alone. 93 Later, when a truce had been signed in Korea, Dulles said with satisfaction, for the first time in history, an international organization has stood against an aggressor. All free nations, large or small, are safer today because the ideal of collective security has been implemented. That was also the opinion of the intellectual community. Rovere wrote, in Korea, the United States proved that its word was as good as its bond, and even better, since no bond had been given. History will cite Korea as the proving ground of collective security, up to this time no more than a plausible theory. It will cite it as a turning point in the world's struggle against communism. Passing the buck to history is a risky business, however, and one vigorous dissenter from the majority view was Lippmann. He didn't believe the United States could count on its allies in small wars. He doubted that the American people would stomach wars for limited objectives, and he had already examined Kennan's containment policy and found it flawed. Kennan had written in Foreign Affairs that containment required an alterable counterforce to the Communists at every point where they show signs of encroaching. This, to Lippmann, meant the endless hemorrhages of guerrilla warfare. The Eurasian continent is a big place, he had wryly observed, and the military power of the United States has certain limitations. Under containment, Lippmann reasoned, the outcome would depend upon draftees or satellite troops. Despair lay either way. America would have to disown our puppets, which would be tantamount to appeasement and defeat and the loss of face, or it would have to support them at an incalculable cost on an unintended, unforeseen and perhaps undesirable issue. Repeatedly he returned to Asia and its traps for containment minded diplomats. To accept a challenge there, Lippmann said, would permit the communists to choose the battlefields, the weapons, and even the nationalities of the Red Battalions. He could not understand how Kennan could have recommended such a strategic monstrosity. 94 When MacArthur learned of the Korean armistice on July 7, 1953, he said, this is the death warrant for Indochina. The Allsop brothers later concluded that one consequence of the growing crisis in Vietnam was to vindicate the judgment of General Douglas MacArthur. The free world would not now be faced with a catastrophe in Asia if MacArthur had won his fight against the artificial limits of the Korean War. Henry Luce, however, did not share the pessimism of Lippmann, MacArthur, and the Allsops. At the time of the general's dismissal, life recalled five years later, the Korean War, had, fitted no larger American strategic goal or plan. Our resistance to Asian communism was therefore spasmodic, opportunistic, and doomed to fail. Since then, however, there has been an improvement. As Luke saw it, the brightest spot on the Oriental map was Saigon. There, he said, we have helped Ngo Dinh Diem bring South Vietnam to the threshold of true national independence.
9511 taps 1951 1964 shortly after MacArthur's Senate testimony, Carlos Romulo breakfasted with him at the Waldorf. The general asked his guest what he thought of the uproar over his recall, and the little Filipino told him that he thought that he and Truman were both right and both wrong. The general raised his eyebrows, and Romulo explained. You should have been allowed to cross the Yalu, he said. MacArthur nodded. Romulo said, you were the man on the spot and knew what should have been done. MacArthur nodded again. The Filipino said, you would have won the war. Another, vigorous nod. Then Romulo said, but civilian rule should always be supreme, and you were wrong to defy the president. The general stared out across the shining city and said nothing. Suddenly, the Filipino recalls, I realized that the conversation was over. He didn't want facts or logic. He wanted salve for his wounded pride. Millions of Americans were aching to give it to him, and for a full year, from the spring of his recall from Tokyo to the spring before the Eisenhower Stevenson presidential campaign of 1952, he crisscrossed the United States in a one man drive to arouse the country to what he regarded as its peril. Invitations from mayors and governors had been accumulating in his suite since the night he had reached the hotel. At first he agreed to visit six cities, then eleven states, in the end the great homecoming, as the MacArthur called it, took them to Chicago, Milwaukee, Boston, Cleveland, Detroit, Houston, San Antonio, Evanston, Fort Worth, Miami, Los Angeles, Little Rock, Seattle, Norfolk, Austin, Natchez, Lansing, Dallas, Murfreesboro, Manchester, New Hampshire, and Portland, Oregon. Had he yielded to the appeals of all the communities that wanted him to come, he would have remained in perpetual motion. America, the general said afterward, took me to its heart with a roar that will never leave my ears. Time noted that the nation was gripped by a kind of patriotic emotion seldom evoked in the doubting cynical mid-century. One doubting cynics who were uncaptivated by the glamorous general observed that the taxpayers were entitled to enjoy his tour, because they were paying for it. That was not entirely true, the day after he said farewell to the Russell Committee, he returned the baton to the Defense Department, as it flies out of my life. I feel I am losing something of inestimable value, and most of his personal expenses were paid by his admirers. When he decided that he wanted to take up permanent residence in the Waldorf Towers, here's where we lighted, and here's where we stay. The hotel leased his dollar $133 a day suite to him for $450 a month. Oil tycoons chartered an Eastern Airlines constellation to fly him to Texas. A friend at United Airlines took care of most of his other flights. When he rode to Massachusetts, the railroad gave him presidential treatment, a special train departing from a siding under the Waldorf, a luxurious private car, and a pilot locomotive steaming ahead to make certain the rails were clear, and Boston's Copley Plaza contributed its finest suite, 531 533 535 as a gesture of appreciation for his services to the country. But he continued to draw his five-star, $19,541 salary from the army, and it was a navy ship which moved his and his aides 49 tons of furniture, 43 pieces of baggage, and three automobiles from Tokyo to Manhattan. Like Eisenhower, MacArthur was a public charge to the end. Unlike Ike, however, he stormed the country, often delivering volatile political speeches, while still wearing his uniform and all his decorations. No one told him to his face that the propriety of this was questionable. If anyone had, he would doubtless have replied that he was still performing his soldierly duties. But many found the spectacle troubling. Americans have a way of consecrating their heroes, putting them on pedestals that are impossibly high and then knocking them off. MacArthur had seemed to be beyond reach. Yet each time he took a swipe at Truman he descended a little. He could never be entirely toppled from his plinth, but the possibility that he might become wobbly began to arise. Too at first it had seemed impossible, 
his crowds were unprecedented. In Chicago, where he rode in a red Lincoln behind a hundred policemen on motorcycles, three million had gathered along the 23-mile parade route, and that night on Soldier Field, 50,000 assembled in 43-degree weather to acclaim him as he stepped into the dramatic glare of a single searchlight. The next morning, Midwesterners lined the 90-mile highway which took him to the MacArthur Old three-story Victorian house in Milwaukee. In Murfreesboro another 50,000 welcomed him. In Houston a half million surged against police lines as an electric sign flashed welcome General Douglas MacArthur across the facade of the Shamrock Hotel, and cannon, parked on the hotel's tennis courts, boomed a salute. Texans cheered him in the Cotton Bowl, in Rice Institute Stadium, in Fort Worth Stadium. In Boston another half million watched his motorcade pass, and 20,000 packed Dewey Square there to hear him. Over 300,000 applauded him in Seattle, and in Miami ovations from 14,000 convening legionnaires interrupted his 45-minute speech 49 times. He addressed the legislatures of four states. Streets were renamed for him. Lansing, Michigan, dedicated its annual tulip display to him. Arthur's Air Force jacket and peaked cap briefly became a rage among teenagers, and the boy and his mother, with her beanie hats and simple dresses, gave the austere general a warmth, a touch of humanity which pleased the mobs and intensified their frenzy. Three, they wanted to give the MacArthur things, to bestow gifts upon them atoning in small ways for the injury their bluff president had inflicted upon them. At Soldier Field, while a fireworks replica of the Missouri blazed in the night sky and a band played God Bless America, Jean was presented a diamond brooch and Arthur a pair of silver skates while all three were showered with $5,000 worth of orchids. Marquette awarded MacArthur an LL.D. Houston gave him a Cadillac. In Murfreesboro, where Jean had lived for 34 years in a pillared mansion on East Lytle Street, she received a silver tray, a brooch, earrings, and a six-starred gold badge. Arthur, who had already been entertained by celebrities in Manhattan's Stork Club and given box seats at both Yankee Stadium and the Polo Grounds, got a Boy Scout scroll, neckerchief, kerchief, slide, and a fishing rod. MacArthur, for once, took a back seat in Murfreesboro. I grew up with the sound of Dixie and the rebel yell ringing in my ears, he said. Dad was on the other side, but he had the good sense to surrender to mother, the city had proclaimed that Monday Miss Jean's day. Bunting hung everywhere in her honor, and a huge sign read, Welcome Jean, the General, and Arthur MacArthur. Old memories moved her to tears there, as her husband was stirred in San Antonio where Wayne Wright, Kruger, and Courtney Hodges greeted him in full uniform and escorted him to the Alamo. For MacArthur always introduced Jean to crowds as my finest soldier. These coast-to-coast -coast journeys were, in fact, something of an ordeal for all of them. The possibility that they might be trampled by stampeding throngs worried Lou Sullivan, whom the New York Police Department had assigned as his out-of-town bodyguard. Sullivan thought Chicago worse than Manhattan. The general stopped to lay a wreath on the tomb of the unknown soldier and the crowd heaved forward. MacArthur had to run to his car, which just took off. We were really scared. Our backup car was caught in the crowd and couldn't catch up with him. Gadflies were air, but there were a few. In Los Angeles a man ran alongside the car with what Sullivan delicately describes as a detrimental banner. The general, with a fine disregard for the First Amendment, said, Sully, get rid of that sign, will you? So, Sullivan recalls, I knocked the guy down and took his sign. Jean's stamina was greater than her husband's or her son's, she looked fresh when they were clearly exhausted, though the time came when she, too, was prostrated. The problem was her old nemesis, air travel. En route to Little Rock aboard a Capital Airlines flight they ran into a gale. The pilot flew under it at a few hundred feet, but the buffeting was severe, and the three MacArthur, Whitney, Bunker, and Sergeant Valbuno, the General's Filipino orderly, vomited into containers all the way. As they taxied toward the terminal, 
MacArthur said, Sully, stand right next to me and take my arm. I'll try not to shake. Five yet once on the ground, Sullivan recalls, he was great, greeting dignitaries, reviewing the honor guard, telling the ladies, it wasn't the sombrero that won the West, it was the sunbonnet. At Natchez that evening a horse and buggy took us to a ball, and the MacArthur danced and danced. Like presidential candidates, the general drew strength from the circus air excitement of the crowds. There was always something to give him a lift, the ceremony on Chicago's State Street, for example, where he laid a wreath on the Batan Corrigidor Bridge and gave the Batan veterans there a Mabu Hay, or Herbert Hoover's statement that General MacArthur may say, old soldiers never die, they just fade away. But the great deeds of men live forever after them. MacArthur was particularly invigorated by children, he issued a standing order that his motorcade always slow down for them, though perhaps he should have pondered the impact of all this commotion on his own gentle, sensitive son. As the throngs began to dwindle toward the end, he might also have weighed the impact of his rhetoric on his popularity. Only once did he yield to his wife's entreaties that he resist the temptation to preach. At a dinner in Seattle's Olympic Hotel he declined to speak because, he said, Jean had told him that he had talked enough in Seattle. Six he certainly had. His remarks in the city that afternoon are a fair sample of what he was telling audiences who had gathered to honor his military and vice all achievements, not his republicanism. Our political stature, he had said, has been sadly impaired by a succession of diplomatic blunders abroad and reckless spendthrift aims at home. There is a growing anxiety in the American home as disclosures reveal graft and corruption over a broad front in our public service. The people, he had continued, have it in their power. To reject the socialist policies covertly and by devious means being forced upon us, to stamp out communist influence which has played so ill-famed a part in the past direction of our public administration. Our country will then reassume that spiritual and moral leadership recently lost in a quagmire of political ineptitude and economic incompetence. Seven Hoover rejoiced in this, and so did Taft but coming from an officer in full uniform it was unseemly. It wasn't even an accurate reflection of his political philosophy. His liberal reforms in Tokyo, his often stated feeling that Japanese policies should be left of center, were wholly inconsistent with it. To be sure, like most American conservatives, he had always linked politics and religion, perhaps because Christianity, and especially Protestantism, is identified with the American past but he had scorned the racial chauvinism of ultra-rightists all his life, unlike them, he disdained Asian colonialism, which, as he had said on one occasion, he firmly believed should be replaced by heretofore unfelt dignity, and the self-respect of political freedom. 8. There was no hint of that in his homecoming speeches, no reminders that this was the man who had introduced so many liberal reforms into post-war Nippon. When Norman Vincent Peale declared, no man of our time is more authentically the voice of real America than Douglas MacArthur, he meant that no other American of MacArthur's stature was speaking more forcefully for the McGuffey readerism which the American electorate had rejected at the polls in the last five presidential elections. Standing bareheaded before the Alamo, the general praised that small band of Texans who stood and died rather than yield the precious concepts of liberty concepts which, he evidently believed, were now extolled by another small band of Texans led by H. L. Hunt and Clint Murchison. He urged removal of the burden of taxation from enterprising industrialists who would otherwise become stultified and inert, burdens imposed by those who seek to convert us to a form of socialistic endeavor, leading directly to the path of communist slavery. 9 Picking up a grand old party theme which found its ultimate expression in McCarthyism, he quoted Lincoln to enthusiastic Michigan legislators, if this nation is ever destroyed, it will be from within, not from without. Destruction would be the consequence of following the United States leaders who, more in line with Marxian philosophy than animated by a desire to preserve freedom, would finance the defense of others as a means of sharing with them our wealth. 
he almost seemed to condemn NATO, our first line of defense for Western Europe is not the Elbe, it is not the Rhine, it is the Yalu. Any other position relied on passive defense, which in all history has never won a war. He blamed political and military leaders who, after VJ Day, dissipated with reckless haste that predominant military power which was the key to the situation. Our forces were rapidly and completely demobilized, he omitted his own role in reducing the United States troop strength in Japan, and the great stores of war material which had been accumulated were disposed of with irresponsible haste and abandoned. Ten here and there he made useful points deploring the concentration of power in the executive branch and warning that ambitious Pentagon officers were eager to forge foreign policy. But these were lost in clots of conservative piety and outrageous distortions. In Boston he said that he had been dismissed for three reasons, his warning of the strategic relationship of Formosa to American security, his readiness to meet the enemy commander at any time to discuss acceptable terms of a ceasefire and his reply to a congressman's request for information. He told the legionnaires that the administration had planned to give Formosa to Mount Seat Red China at the UN, and that his armistice appeal of March 24 unquestionably wrecked the secret plan to yield on these issues as the price for peace in Korea. That was too much for Truman. In a press conference the next day he called MacArthur, in effect, a liar. The general replied that the president would relieve many millions of patriotic minds. If instead of indulging in innuendo and trying to alibi the past, he would announce the firm determination that under no conditions, would the United States permit Formosa to fall in red hands or communist China to be seated in the UN this simple and understandable assurance he has never given. I predict he never will. 11 MacArthur's Counterpunch time jubilantly reported, had plenty of steam behind it. It did, the blows he was delivering undoubtedly contributed to the voters' subsequent repudiation of the administration. Whether they were a wise expenditure of the general's prestige is another matter. Every such speech heightened the impression that he was just another partisan politician, a spokesman for a right-wing greed whose other pulpit ears lacked his stature and his vision. He was inviting retaliation and he got it. Truman's retort had been one thing. Everyone knew that there was a blood feud between the two men now, that each, to justify himself, had to rage at the other. That was their common tragedy, neither could remain true to himself and leave the other unviolated. But in lashing out at the president, the general was also savaging policies embraced by millions who held no brief for Truman's sack of him. Even as he was speaking in Seattle, several civic leaders in the audience had quietly walked out of the hall. The next morning Hugh Mitchell, the city's Democratic congressman, called him a demagogue. Oklahoma's Robert Kerr cried, the Mikado rides again. The New York Post described him as a desperate, demagogic Republican politician fighting a dirty political war, and Eisenhower, commenting on the Legion speech told C. L. Salzberger that his old chief was an opportunist seeking to ride the crest of the wave. Twelve Ike, of course, was about to join him on that wave. He is forgiven because he rode it into the White House. Success, a shrewd French proverb runs, can hide many errors. What was so sad about MacArthur's bitter campaign was that he lost so much and gained so little. By wading into the political surf up to his pipe and braided cap, the public opinion polls reported, he had sacrificed much of his following. Toward the end of a polo grounds game between the Giants and the Phillies, the band played Old Soldiers Never Die as he crossed the diamond to the center field exit with Gene and Arthur. Moments before they reached it a man yelled in a Bronx accent, Hey Mac! How's Harry Truman? And the bleachers burst into laughter and applause. Reminded of the incident later, Truman said, well, of course. The American people always see through a counterfeit. It sometimes takes a little time, but eventually they can always spot one. And MacArthur, I'll tell you, if there ever was to be a counterfeit club, he would have been president of it. That is one position he wouldn't have had to run for, he would have been elected, unanimously. Truman added, 
he struck me as a man there wasn't anything real about. That was a startling appraisal of an American whose place in the history of four Pacific nations, Australia, the Philippines, Japan, and South Korea, was already assured. But the president hadn't made a fool of the general. MacArthur himself had done that. He had asked for it, and Truman, being Truman, had given it to him. 13 on Saturday, March 22, 1952, MacArthur capped his campaign against the administration. Standing on the steps of the Capitol in Jackson, Mississippi, he charged that administration policies were leading toward a communist state with as dreadful certainty as though the leaders of the Kremlin were charting the course. He deplored massive American aid to Europe, charity should begin at home, he said, although billions had been spent on the continent, he doubted that the United States had gained a single convert to the cause of freedom or inspired new or deeper friendships there. Of the Korean truce talks, which had been underway for eight months, he said that the only noticeable result is that the enemy has gained time, and he prophesied that our failure in Korea will probably mean the ultimate loss of continental Asia. The New York Times protested that the bitterness of his attack, on the whole of the Marshall Plan, the strengthening of Western Europe, and the rescue of Greece and Turkey does violence to our own good name and was a disservice to the public. So it was, but much of the public, enough of it to swing a close election, didn't think so. The Times's own correspondent in Jackson had reported that the audience of 25,000 had interrupted his speech 25 times by applause and scattered rebel yells. MacArthur had become a symbol of opposition to the unwinnable war, enthusiasm for which, in Aixon's tart phrase, had reached an irreducible minimum. The following Saturday Truman announced that he would not be a candidate for re-election. MacArthur's nationwide campaign against him had not been the sole reason for the president's decision, but it had certainly been a factor, and MacArthur felt avenged, felt he had achieved one of his goals in that election year. 14 The second goal was to deny the Republican nomination to Eisenhower. On June 10 MacArthur had been chosen to deliver the keynote address at the Grand Old Party Convention, then less than four weeks away and the United States News and World Report observed that his role as keynoter is just a starter. He is ready to lay aside his uniform, retire from the army, do anything necessary to defeat his five-star colleague. On May 15 he had bluntly told the Michigan legislature that he believed that no soldier should be president. Time commented acidly, perhaps because the public remembered his own past willingness to run. Perhaps for other reasons, the MacArthur thrust failed to create any great stir. Among the great man's well-deserved laurels nestled a bunch of slightly sour grapes. The general's favorite for the nomination, he intimated, was the son of the man who had humbled his father in the Philippines a half-century earlier. The United States News and World Report said, slugging openly for Taft is Douglas MacArthur. MacArthur has been making speeches talking to delegates, trying to assure a nomination of the senator. If Taft is nominated, General MacArthur will become a front-rank campaigner. 15 Actually it was more complicated than that. MacArthur's first choice was still MacArthur. Even time, strongly for Ike, saw Ike's former chief in the center of the stage as the nation's best-known anti-Truman leader. Senators and congressmen returning home, the news magazine found, had learned that MacArthur had not faded away. The feeling is not enthusiasm so much as unshakable respect and confidence. It varies geographically, and, is most pronounced in the West and Midwest and least in the East. Speech-making Republicans need only to mention the general's name, or to cite his stand on the Korean War, and the audience applause bursts out. At a rally in Illinois, an applause meter registered most sharply when candidate Harold Stassen promised that his first act as president would be to recall MacArthur to active duty. Republicans who wanted the Pacific General, not the Atlantic General, to lead their ticket banded together under various names, Texas had a demand MacArthur movement, California and Americans for MacArthur Drive, New Hampshire a MacArthur for President Caucus, Pennsylvania a Fighters for MacArthur Committee. They were.
however, weaker than they seemed. A veteran political reporter for the Times thought the general would sweep up all 14 delegates in New Hampshire. Instead, the big winner in New Hampshire was Eisenhower. Eight days later, after Ike had run a strong second to Stassen in Minnesota, he sent word from Paris that he had been persuaded to re-examine his political position. In short, he was packing. One reason, he told a newsman, was his fairly considerable dislike for MacArthur's politics and policies. 16 Defining the precise relationship between MacArthur and Taft at this point is impossible. Like most pre-convention alliances, it was a marriage of convenience, subject to dissolution should the affections of either be alienated by a large block of delegates. Before the Eisenhower boom coalesced, Taft and MacArthur breakfasted in the General's Waldorf Erie. Whitney, who was there, has said that MacArthur opened the conversation by saying, Senator, I have been a Republican all my life and I want you to know that while I do not intend actively to campaign, you will have my fullest support for the Republican nomination. According to Whitney, Taft replied that if he became president he would appoint MacArthur overall commander of the armed forces. But Sullivan, who was also present, remembers it differently. According to him, the agreement was that Taft would try on the first ballot. If he felt he was picking up support, he would go on. If he felt he was going to lose he would go to the rostrum, withdraw, and ask his delegates to vote for MacArthur. A third version, a penciled holograph found in Taft's desk after his death, stipulated, if Senator Taft receives the Republican nomination, in the course of his acceptance he will announce his intention to appeal to General MacArthur's patriotism to permit his name to be presented to the convention as his, Taft's, choice for running mate. Taft would then announce that, if elected, he would make MacArthur his deputy commander-in-chief. The general would share responsibility with him for the formulation of all foreign policy bearing upon the national security. 17 The first test in Chicago came before the platform committee. Dulles proposed a foreign policy plank affirming the United States' commitments in Europe. Taft, MacArthur, and Hoover were against it, and they lost. Then, at 3 p.m. on Monday, July 7, the former scap, wearing civilian clothes in public for the first time since his return, boarded a United Airlines flight to Chicago. Five hours later he mounted the rostrum for the keynote address. It was probably the worst speech of his career, banal and strident in content, wretchedly delivered, a bungling of his chance to become a dark horse. Whenever he mentioned God, which was often, his voice had a disconcerting way of rising an octave and breaking, and he had developed a peculiar habit of jumping up and down and pointing his right forefinger toward the ceiling for emphasis. Halfway through it the delegates began babbling so loudly among themselves that he could scarcely be heard. C. L. Sulzberger wrote, he said nothing but sheer baloney. One could feel the electricity gradually running out of the room. I think he cooked his own goose and didn't do much to help Taft. 18 After conferring with party leaders in the stockyard inn, the general flew home to await the convention's verdict. Discouraged by the poor reception of his address, he instructed the Waldorf switchboard to put no calls through to his suite. Apparently Taft tried to reach him. The crucial maneuvering on Tuesday was in the uncommitted Pennsylvania delegation. At 10 p.m. Red Blake, in New York, received a call from Victor Emmanuel, a key Taft aide. Since Howard Pugh would not release the Keystone State delegates to Taft, Emmanuel said, the senator had abandoned hope for himself. Pew would back MacArthur, however, and Taft was convinced that only a MacArthur candidacy could stop Eisenhower. If he added his delegates to Pennsylvania's, MacArthur might make it. Blake was asked to stand by until 2 a.m., prepared to go to the Waldorf and ask the general to phone Taft at once. Blake recalls that the call from Victor never came. The Eisenhower delegates overcame the more conservative elements in the Republican Party, and I was not commissioned to inform MacArthur of the sudden switch in his favor. According to another version, which cannot be verified, 
the senator was put through to the general on a private line in the hotel. If this account is correct, Taft asked MacArthur to return to Chicago, make a dramatic reappearance on the rostrum, and urge the delegates to choose Taft by acclamation. Perhaps that call was made, but the memories of convention survivors, muddled by exhaustion, are often unreliable. All that can be said with certainty is that in the chaos of the stockyards MacArthur's last chance to become president disappeared. Sullivan recalls that he was deeply disappointed. 19 MacArthur delivers keynote address at 1952 Grand Old Party Convention but he hadn't abandoned hope of solving the Korean conundrum. Speaking before a gathering of industrialists four weeks after the election, he said, while it is well known that my own views have not been sought in any way, yet I am confident that there is a clear and definite solution to the Korean conflict. He could not divulge it there, he said, a present solution involves basic decisions which I recognize as improper for public disclosure or discussion, but which in my opinion can be executed without either an unduly heavy price in friendly casualties or any increased danger of provoking universal conflict. Two days later he received a cable from President-elect Eisenhower, en route home from Korea aboard the USS Helena and feeling generous toward his pre-Chicago adversary, I am looking forward to, an, informal meeting in which my associates and I may obtain the full benefits of your thinking and experience. MacArthur replied, you know, without my saying, that my service is, as it always has been entirely at the disposition of our country. The exchange seemed auspicious, but Ike, like Marshall, was a wary leader, and MacArthur's plan was nothing if not venturesome. 20th On December 17 the General, the President-elect, and John Foster Dulles lunched for over two hours in Dulles's narrow, four-story townhouse on Manhattan's East 91st Street, just off Park Avenue. MacArthur handed Eisenhower a 14-point memorandum calling for a summit conference immediately after the inauguration at which Ike would present Stalin with an ultimatum, demanding the unification of Korea and Germany, the withdrawal of all foreign troops from them and from Japan, a U.S.U.S.S.R. guarantee of Korean, German, and Japanese neutrality and the introduction in the Russian and American constitutions of a provision outlawing war as an instrument of national policy. If Stalin balked, atomic weapons would be dropped on North Korea and China's capacity to wage modern war would be neutralized by bombing. The general acknowledged that these steps were drastic, but it is obvious that American public opinion will not indefinitely countenance the present indecision and inertia. 21 While Eisenhower studied the memo, MacArthur summed it up for the future Secretary of State and asked him what he thought of it. Dulles vaguely praised it but said, I believe that Eisenhower should first consolidate his position as president before attempting so ambitious and comprehensive a program. It might take him a year to do so. After all, it has been 20 years since the Republicans were in power. MacArthur instantly replied that Ike would be at the peak of his power and prestige the day of his inaugural. He vigorously argued that timing is of the essence, and logic requires a showdown at the height of the president's world popularity. To procrastinate, however, is to give a signal to the Russians to expedite the arms race, eventually nullifying our advantage. He turned to Eisenhower and said, Today the Russians have such respect for you that strong action will bring them to terms. If you wait, they will no longer follow you as the leader of world opinion. This is the last time I shall call you I can speak to you on equal terms. Hereafter you will be Mr. President. So now I say that you have the opportunity to be perhaps the greatest man since Jesus Christ, as only you can dictate the peace of the world. I beg of you to take the initiative with bold action. He took the memo, folded it, tucked it in Eisenhower's breast pocket, patted the place, and said softly, God bless you. Twenty-two outside, a small crowd awaited them, reporters, passers-by, and, in that select neighborhood, nursemaids and poodles. Linking his arm in MacArthur's, the president-elect said, we had a very fine conversation on the subject of peace, not only in Korea but in the world in general. MacArthur said of Ike, 
I haven't seen him for nearly six years. It is the resumption of an old friendship and comradeship that has existed for thirty-five years. That was the most that could be said of it. The two men, despite their close association in the 1930s, were incapable of understanding each other. One represented a poetic vision of great drama, the other, the even perspective of hard prose. So that was the end of it. Truman had directed Omar Bradley to write the Waldorf, asking for the details of the general's peace plan. MacArthur frostily answered that he had given them to the president-elect, though he would, of course, be glad to participate in a coordinated discussion of the matter with the Joint Chiefs of Staff. On December 29th Bradley thanked him in four terse sentences, wishing him a happy and prosperous new year. Neither the White House nor the Pentagon approached the general on the subject again. His advice would be as unwelcome to the new administration as it had been to the old. Dulles, like Aikson, was a believer in limited wars. The old general, one feels, had become an embarrassment to the leaders of both parties, an unwelcome reminder of the gallant past, now lost forever, in which intolerable differences between great nations could be resolved by the sword. 23 In its penultimate year, the outgoing administration had dealt MacArthur one last, unforgivable blow. Diplomats from 51 nations were invited to attend the signing of the Japanese Peace Treaty in San Francisco but the man who had created the post-war Nipponese state was ignored. The general said dryly, perhaps someone just forgot to remember. But he hadn't been forgotten. Bernard Barrach urged Aixson to send him an invitation. Aixson explains in his memoirs, I had not provided for this in the rules and was not inclined to do so. A number of commentators, among them H. V. Calton Bourne, were highly critical of the lapse. So was Sebald, the senior advisor to the American delegation. Foggy Bottom was unimpressed. Shiju Yoshida sent word to the Waldorf that he had wanted to fly east and pay his respects, but had been advised by the State Department that it would be inappropriate. 24 Clark Lee called this an unbelievably petty snub and a stupid propaganda error which was bound to have repercussions throughout the Far East. It did not, however diminish the devotion of the Japanese to their former ruler. Yoshida wrote him, fondly and gratefully I cherish the memories of our intimate contact, you as supreme commander for the allied powers and I as executor of your directives. You were so good to me, so kind and generous that I was able to perform my duty to the best of my ability, and thereby contribute my might to the making of the new Japan. The general, he said, would be delighted to see with your own eyes how firmly your epochal reforms have taken root in Japanese soil. Three years after the signing of the treaty Yoshida called at Suite 37A, and the following year his foreign minister, Meimuru Shijemitsu, arrived there on the 10th anniversary of the surrender ceremony aboard the Missouri. MacArthur recalled Scap's veto of plans to punish the emperor and said he was against trials of all so-called war criminals forgetting his execution of Yamashita and Homa. Japan awarded him the highest decoration it could confer on a foreigner who was not a head of state, the Grand Cordon of the Order of the Rising Sun with Paulonia flowers. Accompanying it was a signed scroll from Hirohito. The general said he could recall no parallel in history where a great nation recently at war has so distinguished its former enemy commander. 25 If he remained modest, he became less jagged in his judgments. For a time he seemed to be mellowing toward the man who had relieved him. After a stag dinner in the Manhattan apartment of another retired general, a fellow guest had the temerity to ask his opinion of Truman. According to Sullivan, MacArthur surprised everyone by saying, the little bastard had guts to fire me, and I like him. On another occasion he called the former president a man of raw courage. And on a third he said with a chuckle, judging from the way he handled me, he'd make a pretty good fullback. But that was before Truman's memoirs appeared. When they did, hinting that the general had been responsible for South Korean unpreparedness in June 1950 and accusing him of insubordination, MacArthur erupted. Pre-war the United States policy in Korea, he pointed out, was initiated in Washington. But it was the belated claim of insubordination, 
made by Truman as a private citizen. Without the officer concerned being given a hearing and an opportunity to defend himself, which really rankled. It provoked the worst in him. He charged that everyone instrumental in his dismissal, Marshall, Harriman, Aikson, Bradley, had been personally hostile to me. In the case of Bradley this was difficult to justify, since the two men were virtual strangers. The general explained that Bradley knew he had been critical of him because the Battle of the Bulge, where he was the ground commander, resulted in approximately as many American casualties as were sustained in the entire Southwest Pacific area campaigns from Australia to Tokyo. Twenty-six like the crowd at the polo grounds, his critics laughed. He didn't know how to handle them, he never had. It was correct to say of his recall, as he did then, that no office boy, no charwoman, no servant of any sort would have been dismissed with such callous disregard for the ordinary decencies, but that wasn't the way to put it, and it should have come from someone else. There would have been no lack of volunteers. He still had legions of eloquent defenders. Truman, showing Carlos Romulo through his presidential library in independence, pointed at a picture of the general and said, well, you know who that is, that's God. Romulo said evenly, Mr. President, there are millions of Filipinos who think he is just that. Chastened, Truman said, it means a great deal to me that the citizens of another country feel that way about a fellow American. In time MacArthur also regained his perspective. One afternoon on Park Avenue a stranger stopped him on the street and said, your pictures do you a great injustice, Mr. Truman. The general told Jean, I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. 28 he insisted that he had found the liberties of private life refreshing and exhilarating. I have enjoyed to the full the relaxation of release from the arduous responsibilities of high national command. One doubts that. MacArthur was a restive civilian, resentful of the egalitarian passions of post-war America. His mother, and then his first wife, had thought he might be challenged by the business world and he sought engrossment in it now. After the collapse of his political hopes in 1952, he had finally consented to become board chairman of Remington Rand, later Sperry Rand. His salary was $45,533, then $68,000. Debonair in custom tailored suits, he commuted by limousine two or three times a week to the firm's offices in Stamford, Connecticut which for tax purposes became his legal residence. Board meetings were held in his 75-foot-long living room. He was as immune to abrasive encounters as any civilian can be. Nevertheless, he had to face a species of pest he had been spared in the army, a heckler.29 The confrontation came during one of Rand's annual stockholders meetings in Buffalo. Louis D. Gilbert a World War II Army corporal in the Southwest Pacific and now the holder of 3,800 Rand shares, rose from his seat to express serious concern over the fact that the chairman of the board owned none of the company's stock. MacArthur snapped, Will you sit down? Gilbert did, but the audience, sympathetic to him, began to buzz. The general said piously, Such money as I am able to invest I have placed in defense bonds to help our beloved country. The buzzing continued. MacArthur, realizing that he could issue no orders here, said weakly, it constitutes democracy when we don't agree on everything. But the issue would not go away, and at the next annual meeting the former corporal was gratified to discover that MacArthur now held 800 Rand shares. The general accepted the congratulations of a fellow veteran of mine in the Pacific, but said, I bought the stock because it was the best buy on the market. I bought it in spite of your arguments last year. And in fact it had jumped from 15 points to 21, giving him a $4,800 paper profit on his $12,000 investment. But the contratom had been humiliating. No one had dressed him down for so trivial a matter since Pershing in 1918.30 His chief functions at RAN were to announce dividends and speak at banquets of organizations like the National Association of Manufacturers delivering the kind of speeches NARM audiences like to hear, assaults on income taxes, swollen federal budgets, 
and the small group of individuals who were attempting to impose a form of socialistic, totalitarian rule, a sort of big brother deity to run our lives for us. Typically he said that the fundamental and ultimate issue at stake is liberty, itself. Freedom to live under the minimum of restraint. The free enterprise system or the cult of conformity. The result will determine the future of civilization. It will be felt on every human life. It will be etched in blazing rainbow colors on the very arch of the sky. Yet he wasn't always that dreary. Like many economists on the other end of the political spectrum, he foresaw poverty for the first time faced with possible extinction. And in 1957, to the delight of liberal pacifists like Roger Baldwin, he lashed out at large Pentagon budgets. Our government has kept us in a perpetual state of fear, kept us in a continuous stampede of patriotic fervor, with the cry of grave national emergency, he said. Always there has been some terrible evil. To gobble us up if we did not blindly rally behind it by furnishing the exorbitant funds demanded. Yet, in retrospect, these disasters seem never to have happened, seem never to have been quite real. The nation commented, for once, we like his oratory, we hope he will return. 31 In those years Ridgeway, Gavin, and Maxwell Taylor were developing the rationale of flexible response in small conflicts, theories which would be tested in Southeast Asia after MacArthur's death. The general was unimpressed by them. Ever the absolutist, he continued to insist that the only humane way to end battles was by total effort. In the second year of the Eisenhower administration, in off the record interviews with Jim G. Lucas of Scripps Howard and Hearst's Bob Considine, he said he could have ended the Korean War in ten days if he had been given a free hand. The enemies there would first have been taken out by nuclear attacks on Manchurian air bases. Then he would have enveloped the enemy with 500,000 of Chiang Kai-shek's troops, sweetened by two United States Marine divisions and landed behind the Chinese lines. These forces could have formed a wall of manpower and firepower across the northern border of Korea. Now, the Eighth Army, spread along the 38th parallel, would have put pressure on the enemy from the south. The Marines and the Chinese nationalists would press down from the north. In little more than a week, he said, the starving Chinese and North Koreans would have sued for peace. Sowing a belt of radioactive cobalt from the Sea of Japan to the Yellow Sea, he would have prevented another land invasion of Korea from the north for at least 60 years. 32 a year later, however, he changed his mind. His revulsion against war had grown. He decided that Eisenhower and Dulles had been right in rejecting his proposed ultimatum to Stalin, atomic bombs, he felt, should never be used. On his 75th birthday, he squired his wife aboard United Airlines Flight 709 to Los Angeles for a series of appearances in California where he intended to say just that. A reporter noted, his famous stride had become a careful step, his hands looked transparent and his skin like parchment, but his back was West Point straight, his manner commanding. The stewardess had been told to refrain from telling him to fasten his seatbelt, he never did it, even though Jean worried when they flew through unusual turbulence. The plane landed in dense smog, an American Legion color guard marched into a fence. The general paid Hollywood one of the hammiest and, since he could scarcely see through the haze, one of the most inappropriate, of his tributes, there are no lost horizons here except in the matchless imagery of your studios. But then the fog lifted and the journey took on a more promising aspect. He attended the dedication of MacArthur Park, a memorial with a statue of him and, in a reflecting pool, replicas of the islands he had seized from 1942 to 1945. He told an Episcopal diocese luncheon that although I am not trained in ecclesiastic methods nor am I skilled in theological law, none of his achievements in Japan had left me with a greater sense of personal satisfaction than my spiritual stewardship. Although I am of Caesar, I did try to render unto God that which was his. Then, addressing banqueting legionnaires in the Ambassador Hotel that evening, 
he proposed that armed conflicts between nations be outlawed. 33 He honored patriotism. The millions whose faith and courage built the immortal way from which was fashioned the true greatness of our country made him revere the stars in our flag far more than any stars on my shoulders. But calls to arms were obsolete. At the turn of the century, when I entered the army, the target was one enemy casualty at the end of rifle or bayonet or sword. Then came the machine gun, designed to kill by the dozen. After that, the heavy artillery, raining death by the hundreds. Then the aerial bomb, to strike by the thousands, followed by the atom explosion to reach the hundreds of thousands. Now, electronics and other processes of science have raised the destructive potential to encompass millions. And with restless hands we work feverishly in dark laboratories to find the means to destroy all at one blow. This very triumph of scientific annihilation had destroyed the possibility of war being a medium of practical settlement of international differences. War had become a Frankenstein's monster to both sides. No longer is it the weapon of adventure whereby a shortcut to international power and wealth, a place in the sun, can be gained. If you lose, you are annihilated. If you win, you stand only to lose. No longer does it possess the chance of the winner of a duel, it contains rather the germs of double suicide. Abolishing war was the one issue upon which both sides can agree, for it is the one issue upon which both sides will profit equally. It is the one issue, and the only decisive one, in which the interests are completely parallel. It is the one issue which, if settled, might settle all others. After such a provision had been written into the Nipponese constitution, he recalled, Kijuro Shidehara had told him, The world will laugh and mock us as impractical visionaries, but a hundred years from now we will be called prophets. 34 MacArthur at West Point in 1957 Beneath the lines he composed MacArthur at the Manila Hotel, on his sentimental journey to the Philippines. July 1961 For once America's liberal press treated MacArthur handsomely. The New York Herald Tribune believed he had never seemed a grander figure. The New Yorker thought that this speech presents in quite brilliant form the opinions of a warrior, the dreams of a poet, the recommendations of a patriot. The reporter observed that the extraordinary contradictions in this man were proportionate to his greatness, which is real. The general was heartened, he began referring frequently to elder statesmen, and while the references were not directly to himself, a friend recalls, it was evident that he was thinking along those lines. Eisenhower and Kennedy invited him to lunch in the White House, and Lyndon Johnson visited him. He enjoyed the meeting with Ike Least. His host wasn't interested in his counsel and MacArthur left looking gaunt and dour, all he told reporters was, responsibility goes with authority. I am no longer in a position of authority. The president's view of him may have been colored by a Joe Martin proposal, backed by Everett Dirksen, to make MacArthur a six-star general, which would have left Eisenhower one star behind. The measure was tabled, but it might have been good politics. The old soldier had regained a great deal of his popularity. Roger Baldwin regarded him as a national monument. Columbia University, with the encouragement of Governor Nelson Rockefeller, announced the establishment of a General Douglas MacArthur Chair in History. And in London the BBC, reporting that he was undergoing surgery at Lenox Hill Hospital to correct a prostate gland condition, observed that the operation dominates the news of America here in Europe especially in Britain. Throughout England, where memoir writing field marshals tend to be heavily critical of American commanders in World War II, General MacArthur is a highly regarded and non-controversial figure. While even President Eisenhower's command decisions in Europe are considered fair game for post-war critics, military men here have unreserved praise for General MacArthur's conduct of the Pacific and Korean Wars. 35 John Kennedy admired MacArthur and probably understood him better than any other president. He was Kennedy's kind of hero, valiant, a patrician, proud of his machismo, and a lover of glory. Eisenhower's successor, unlike Ike, sought the general's advice. In the fourth month of his presidency, 
the young chief executive flew to New York to consult him. According to Theodore C. Sorensen, General Douglas MacArthur, in an April, 1961, meeting with the president, warned him against the commitment of American soldiers on the Asian mainland, and the president never forgot this advice. Arthur M. Schlesinger, Jr., writes, MacArthur expressed his old view that anyone wanting to commit American ground forces to the mainland should have his head examined. Afterward Kennedy told Walt W. Rostow that he had decided not to risk sending American ground troops to Indochina, that the 10,000 the United States Marines who were suited up on Okinawa could stand down. 36 A pleasanter contact between the old soldier and the young president came a few weeks later, when Carlos Romulo, then the Philippine envoy to Washington, called on Pierre Salinger to say that his government, now celebrating the 15th anniversary of its independence, wanted the general and Jean to attend the festivities as guests of the nation. Salinger led Romulo into the Oval Office, where the president, breaking into a broad smile, said he was placing a presidential plane at MacArthur's disposal and wanted to see him on his return. Frail but erect at 81, the general broke his trip with a layover at an American airbase near Tokyo and landed at Clark Field to start what he called a sentimental journey. A great shout went up as he stepped from the Boeing 707 in his faded khaki and frayed cap. His hand shook as he saluted the crowd, he told them how moved he was to be back in the land that I have known so well and amongst these people that I have loved so well, and said, my life has been interwoven with yours for nearly sixty years. Here I have lived my greatest moments. Here I have my greatest memories. 37A band broke into old soldiers never die. A crawling Cadillac carried the MacArthur through two million cheering Filipinos to Manila. It was a national holiday, children fought to get the old man's autograph. Overwhelming, he gasped on arriving at Malacanan Palace. As the throng outside sang hymns, Dato Plang, an elderly official to whom General Arthur MacArthur had presented a sabre in 1900, presented it to General Douglas MacArthur. Speaking to a joint session of the Philippine Congress, MacArthur recalled that during his last visit to the crash of guns rattled windows, the sputter of musketry drowned voices, the acrid smell of smoke filled our nostrils, the stench of death was everywhere. Carl Middens of life wondered, who else would have thought of burp guns and bazookas as musketry? 38 MacArthur at the White House with President John F. Kennedy, 1961 at Lingain the general told Jean, this is what I wanted you to see, running his hand gently over a plaque commemorating his landing the 16 years earlier. Lunata Park in central Manila was packed on July 4 when MacArthur told the crowd, in what everyone knew would be his last words to them, even as I hail you, I must say farewell. For such is the nature of my visit. I must admit, with a sense of sadness, that the deepening shadows of life cast doubt upon my ability to pledge again, I shall return. So, my dear friends, I close with a fervent prayer that a merciful God will protect and preserve each and every one of you and will bring this land peace and tranquility always. At the end of a luncheon in the rebuilt Manila Hotel the audience broke into an impromptu rendition of Let Me Call You Sweetheart, and as their voices died down he turned to Jean and kissed her. A Filipino told Middens, General MacArthur kisses his wife only in the presence of his family, and we are his family. Deeply stirred as he was then, he was moved even more, moved to tears when he discovered that their government had kept a post-war vow that the name of Douglas MacArthur would never be permitted to die among the soldiers of the Republic of the Philippines, that it was heard every day when a roll was called, and that a sergeant always responded, present in spirit. 39 On July 20 Kennedy received the general in Washington, questioned him about his trip, and sought his views of other Far East problems. Afterward MacArthur told the press that he and the president had discussed the world situation and reminisced about our comradeship in the Pacific War, where Kennedy had been a brave and resourceful young naval officer. Judging from the luncheon he served me, the general added with a twinkle, he seems to be living somewhat higher on the hog these days.
the Treasury Department minted a gold medal in honour of the President's guest, bearing the inscription, Protector of Australia, Liberator of the Philippines, Conqueror of Japan, Defender of Korea. 40 The following year Congress passed a resolution expressing gratitude to MacArthur, accepting it from Speaker John W. McCormack on the Capitol steps, he said, a general is just as good or just as bad as the troops under his command make him. Mine were great. He was again welcomed at the White House and asked what course he would recommend in Southeast Asia. Truman was urging an escalating the United States commitment in Vietnam. The general disagreed. He said that he felt America should hold firm to the periphery but avoid commitments on the mainland. According to Blake, in whom he confided, he had advised Kennedy, as later, when he was dying at Walter Reed Hospital, he vainly advised President Johnson, that no American soldier should be made to fight on Asian soil. He stated his belief that the time might be dangerously near when many Americans might not have the will to fight for their country. 41 Later that year, at Robert Kennedy's request, MacArthur settled a dispute between two athletic associations over U.S. participation in the 1964 Olympics, but that was his last mission. He knew he was approaching the end now, he was putting his affairs in order, arranging for his burial and the deposit of his papers in Norfolk, his mother's home. His last and most memorable goodbye was to West Point. Addressing the Corps of Cadets, he took as his text the Academy's motto, Duty, Honor, Country. Interestingly, he warned them never to dispute controversial issues with their civilian leaders, these great national problems are not for your professional or military solution. Then, speaking without a note, striding back and forth, he closed with a passage that no one who was on the plane that noon will ever forget, the shadows are lengthening for me. The twilight is here. My days of old have vanished, tone and tint, they have gone glimmering through the dreams of things that were. Their memory is one of wondrous beauty, watered by tears, and coaxed and caressed by the smiles of yesterday. I listen vainly, but with thirsty ear, for the witching melody of faint bugles blowing reveille, of far drums beating the long roll. In my dreams I hear again the crash of guns the rattle of musketry, the strange, mournful mutter of the battlefield. But in the evening of my memory, I always come back to West Point. Always there echoes and re-echoes in my ears, duty, honor, country. Today marks my final roll call with you. But I want you to know that when I cross the river my last conscious thoughts will be of the Corps, and the Corps, and the Corps. I bid you farewell. 42 He had not, of course, spoken extemporaneously. No one could improvise such rhetoric. The awed cadets thought that he was coining the phrases as he trod the platform before them, but what they had actually witnessed was the last performance of a consummate actor who always wrote his own lines beforehand, honed and polished them, and committed them to memory. Lou Sullivan recalls him pacing like a brooding hawk through his ten room apartment puffing a corn cob as he rehearsed, his slippers flapping on the rugs and his long robe streaming behind him. In a way these scenes were more spectacular than the final production. An oriental butler stood by with a glass of water, and the striding general was surrounded by evocations of the Far East, paintings, vases, urns, and other gifts from the Japanese. In the vast splendor, recalls William Agano who renewed their acquaintance there after an interval of thirty-nine years, I had the feeling that I had barged into a palace. 43 Except on MacArthur's birthdays, when his former officers gathered to honor him, not many others saw him. Hoover and James A. Farley, Waldorf neighbors, were always welcome, Red Blake would bring diagrams of new plays, and West Point Superintendent James B. Lampert would escort delegations of first-classmen to assure the general that the academy hadn't changed and to hear his prophecies on the future of their profession. Strangers, however, were turned away by elaborate security precautions. Elevator operators wouldn't take them above the 35th floor unless they could produce credentials, those who had them were met upstairs by Sullivan and, when his bodyguard duties ended after 30 months and he was transferred elsewhere, 
hotel security men replaced him. No one could phone the suite unless switchboard operators had been given their names. Even then, Jean took all calls, making very sure that the general wanted to speak to the caller before handing him the phone. 44 MacArthur with Cadet Colin P. Gully 2, January 1963 President Lyndon B. Johnson visits MacArthur at Walter Reed Hospital Sullivan continued to visit him one or two times a week, and often he would spend the evening with the general and Jean, the three of them watching television. In the beginning his bodyguard had thought MacArthur cold and austere, but later he concluded that this was largely reticence, a MacArthur friend, he found, was a cherished friend. As they watched televised baseball, the general would always recite a player's batting average before the man reached the plate, the old soldier would cover Sullivan's hand with his own from time to time and say gently, how are you doing, Sully? He gave the bodyguard pipes and a .32 caliber Smith & Wesson, and showed him the derringer he himself carried whenever he left the apartment, like Eisenhower during his years as President of Columbia, MacArthur never ventured into Manhattan unarmed. Once Sullivan revealed that he planned to enter a Randall's Island track meet. MacArthur fired him up with a pep talk, ending, don't come back unless you're a winner. Inspired. The bodyguard broke the track's hammer throw record and, though he was the oldest man there, he was voted the meet's outstanding athlete. He recalls, I think the general could talk anybody into anything. Neither MacArthur nor his wife had expected to end their lives in a New York hotel. During the Tokyo years she had dreamed of retiring to a little white house in the south, the house he had then had in mind was the same color but somewhat larger. I should have lived here. He had wistfully told Kennedy, but the Waldorf was centrally located, within short distance of both St. Bartholomew's Episcopal Church, she and Arthur joined the congregation there, and First Army Headquarters at 90 Church Street, where, in a four-room corner suite which had been cleared for him, the general read the cable traffic each morning. Fifth Avenue's smart shops were just two blocks away from the Waldorf, Jean could find endless displays of the clothes and jewelry she loved, matched pearls, head-hugging caps, she felt that anything larger overpowered her, and black opera pumps in her rare size, five and one half triple A. Black had become her favorite shade, but now, to keep abreast of the mid-century trend toward pale colors, she added dresses of gray, white, and a mauve pink. Her husband also became something of a clothes horse. Debonair in a Homburg and herringbone suits, he often visited at the men's wear department of Saks Fifth Avenue. The manager was ecstatic, what a figure to work with. Wonderful. A tailor's dream. 45 One of his acquisitions at Saks was a dinner jacket, for Broadway's theaters had been one of the MacArthur incentives in settling down here. They saw Oklahoma. The Hollywood Ice Review, and the rodeo in Madison Square Garden, Ethel Merman and Judy Garland entertained them backstage, when they tired of plays and musical comedies, there were concerts, lectures, the New York City Ballet, and, of course, the movies at Radio City, where their favorite stars were John Wayne and Ward Bond. Ever the athlete Mank, MacArthur never missed a fight. At Yankee Stadium, the Polo Grounds, and Ebbets Field. He usually sat in the owner's boxes. No matter how far behind his team was, he always remained to the bitter end, an intent, fragile old man with thin white hair, eyes gleaming and fist clenched, demanding a comeback against all odds. In time he came to know many of the players personally. The one he admired most, and liked most, was Jackie Robinson. Archer never accompanied the MacArthur on their outings. One room in the suite was hers, and she became something of a recluse there. Arthur no longer needed her. He was at school, or taking piano lessons, or visiting the Statue of Liberty with Sully and his son Bobby, roaming the homeland which he was learning to know and love at last. Like the general, Jean had assumed that he would attend West Point. Shortly after they had unpacked at the Waldorf, they took the boy up the Hudson. He watched a parade and tried on a cadet's shako. It didn't fit then, it never would, 
he wasn't meant for a military career. Instead he attended Columbia, graduating in 1961. The old soldier insisted that he approved because, he told Bunker, my mother put too much pressure on me. Being number one is the loneliest job in the world, and I wouldn't wish it on any son of mine. Apparently being a MacArthur was too much, after his father's death Arthur moved to the other side of Manhattan and took an assumed name. His identity thus concealed, he lived for his music, a fugitive from his father's relentless love. 46 people grow old only by deserting their ideals, MacArthur had written, paraphrasing another writer. Years may wrinkle the skin, but to give up interest wrinkles the soul. You are as young as your faith, as old as your doubt, as young as your self-confidence, as old as your fear, as young as your hope, as old as your despair. In the central place of every heart there is a recording chamber, so long as it receives messages of beauty, hope, cheer and courage, so long are you young. When? Your heart is covered with the snows of pessimism and the ice of cynicism, then and then only are you grown old, and then, indeed, as the ballad says, you just fade away. He remained confident, hopeful, undespairing, optimistic, and free of doubt to the end. But on January 26, 1964, the day he turned 84, it was clear that at long last he was ready to depart this life. He had just finished his 213,000 word memoirs, a soiled spot on the back of one chair marked the place where he had rested his head while covering pad after pad of 14 inch yellow ruled paper with his angular Victorian scrawl. To a writer, the manuscript is astonishing. There are almost no erasures or deletions, the prose flowed from him in an even, immutable stream. Soldiers' memoirs are generally dull. MacArthur's, which appeared after his death, are vivid and controversial, controversial both in substance and in style, because certain passages seemed to have been lifted from earlier books by Whitney and Willoughby. It is difficult to see the general as a plagiarist, and in fact there may be other explanations. They may all have been drawing on a common source, notes made in the past, or it is possible that the general wrote those paragraphs shortly after his dismissal holding them for future publication, and that his officers took them from him. At all events, the rest of the text was certainly his, and it testified as nothing else could that his mind was penetrating and lucid to the end. But his body was failing fast. Dr. Edgeberg believes that he might have survived for years had he sought medical attention earlier. He disliked physicians as such. However, perhaps because they reminded him of infirmities he preferred to ignore. The Army 11, arriving in early December to discuss last week's Navy game with him, had been shocked to find him shrunken in height and weight and jaundiced. So were the officers who filed in, wearing all their ribbons as they always did because he liked that, to congratulate him for having reached another birthday. Some of them sensed that this would be his last, and so, it developed, did he.47 they stiffened at attention as he entered the living room. He began, as always, with a ringing, comrades at arms. Then, putting them at ease, he said, in much the same words of previous years, you probably don't realize how much I look forward to these gatherings, bringing back vivid memories of the experiences we shared. These are milestones in my life, as it were, and I look forward to each one hopefully and accepted gratefully. This time, however, he said he wanted to depart from custom and tell them a story about a Scotsman who was riding a crowded train from London to Edinburgh. At the first stop, he said, he worked his way over the knees of the others in the compartment, and they saw him run into the station and get back on board just as the train was pulling out. At the next stop he did the same thing, and when he just barely caught the train on the third stop, one of the passengers said, Jock, why are you running into the station at every stop? We have conveniences on the train. Stay aboard. And Jock looked up and around the group and said, I'll tell you. I'm a very sick man. Yesterday I went to see my doctor and the doctor told me that my days were few. He said, Jock, if you want to see your old Scotland again, 
you'd better start right out and go up there, and, mind you, even though you start now, you may not get there. So I'm buying my ticket from station to station. Everyone started to laugh and stopped when they saw that the general's face was grave. 48 by March 1st his weight was down to 140 pounds. He was suffering from nausea, constant headache, and what he described as abdominal complaints. The yellowish pigmentation of his skin and eyes was deepening, a physician diagnosed his jaundice as moderately severe. Informed of this by the Surgeon General, President Johnson phoned the Waldorf that evening and told the General that an Air Force transport would pick him up at LaGuardia Field in the morning to fly him to the Walter Reed Medical Center in Washington. Superintendent Lampert and a group of other officers rode to the airport to see him and Gene off. MacArthur, walking shakily to the plane, said, I've looked that old scoundrel death in the face many times. This time I think he has me on the ropes. But I'm going to do the very best I can. 49 On March 6 Army doctors performed exploratory surgery to find the obstruction in his biliary system. They feared malignancy but there was none. Liver damage and several gallstones were discovered, however, and the gallbladder was removed. His condition was described as satisfactory. Nevertheless he was weak. Blood transfusions began, and Jean and Arthur settled into a three-room suite at the hospital for a long vigil. Two more major operations followed, to remove a duct and intestinal obstruction with perforation and to relieve esophageal bleeding in critical condition. He clung to life for four incredible weeks, regaling physicians, nurses, and orderlies with reminiscences until the night of Friday, April 3rd, when he sank into a peaceful coma. He died at 2.39 p.m. Sunday from acute kidney and liver failure. 50 at 5.07 p.m. A 12-car autocade left Walter Reed for New York. There was a touching scene between Jean and a nurse, both red-eyed, consoling each other, and a police escort led the hearse and the rest of the cavalcade through the dank evening to Manhattan's 7th Regiment Armory at Park Avenue and 66th Street. By 10.47 p.m. when the coffin was carried into the armory's clerk room, the tributes had begun to pour in. President Johnson ordered 19-gun salutes fired on American military posts around the world and flags flown at half-staff until the burial Saturday in Norfolk. 51 The plain, grey steel, government tissue casket rested on a catafalque between four flickering candles, it was half open, the bottom half covered with the stars and stripes. The general's own flag, five white stars on a field of red, stood alongside. He wore twin circlets of stars, but no ribbons on his breast, his instructions on that point had been explicit. Also at his direction, he was dressed in his most faded suntans, worn and washed to softness. Smoothing this uniform, he had once told Middens, I suppose, in a way, this has become part of my soul. It is a symbol of my life. Whatever I've done that really matters, I've done wearing it. When the time comes, it will be in these that I journey forth. What greater honor could come to an American, and a soldier? 52 The setting was appropriate, five men, representing the five services, stood around the catafalque at parade dressed. The armory had been built in 1880, the year of the general's birth, and the clerk room had an air of old-fashioned elegance. The ceiling was lofty, the panelling was of polished oak, one wall was dominated by a massive fireplace which was all but obscured Monday afternoon by masses of fragrant flowers. Some of them came from MacArthur's first wife, who told reporters that her years with him had been the happiest of my life. That, too, seemed fitting, he had always relished superlatives. What was inapt was the appearance, in the scripts Howard and Hearst papers, of the Lucas and Considine interviews, now ten years old and unreflective of his later convictions. Whitney called them fictional nonsense, and Lucas called Whitney a liar. Life said, worse than a spectre at a feast is a loud-mouthed gossip at a funeral. The Saturday Review said, they demanded for him the highest honors but they saw to it that he was deprived of a decent burial. Who are they?
Only superficially are they the scoop hungry newsmen. More basically, they are the extremist supporters who never really understood him. Max Scully wrote in The Reporter, throughout his life, he had the gift or the curse of being a storm center. May his soul rest in peace, for here on earth his memory will never know peace. 53 MacArthur would have gloried in his funeral. He had drawn up plans for it, of course, he planned everything, but his instructions, from the GI casket to the ribbonless blouse, had been uncharacteristically modest, intended, perhaps, to be conspicuous in their simplicity. President Kennedy, now four months in his own grave, had persuaded him of the need for a suitable national tribute, with West Point's cadets playing a prominent part. Told of it, the general had smiled and said, By George, I'd like to see that. On Monday, in a chill rain, the 2,500 men of the Corps formed on the plane, MacArthur's old room, 1,123, provided an excellent view of the scene, and, facing the Hudson, saluted as six cannon roared in salute, the smoke mingling with the mists on the bluffs overlooking the river. Lampert told them, the gallant battle which he waged in his last days symbolized to all of us the very principles to which he dedicated his living. Later in the day, first classmen, their sleeves streaked with chevrons of authority, appeared at the armory, one of them taking his station by the five-star flag, which he would carry in the coming parade. On Tuesday 35,000 New Yorkers, standing three abreast outside the brass-studded doors in a line that stretched north past 72nd Street, waited to pass by the beer, and at 8 a.m. Wednesday, as a bugle signal ruffles and flourishes, the senior cadet commanded the procession, now ready to move, toward Harch. Fifty-four flags stirred in a rising breeze, but the rain, still heavy, drenched them. The first units in the four-block-long order of march were the West Point Band, a battalion of cadets, and an honor guard of generals and admirals. Then came the caisson drawn by six Fort Myer horses and carrying the coffin, now fully closed and flag-draped. Following it were the five-star standard, a riderless, caparisoned horse with reversed boots in its stirrups, the symbol of a fallen warrior since the days of Genghis Khan, and massed colors and marches. Watched by millions on television, they proceeded down Park Avenue, 57th Street, Broadway, and 7th Avenue to Pennsylvania Station. At 9.15 a.m. the funeral train pulled out, stopping briefly at Trenton and slowing at Edenton and Aberdeen in Maryland for military delegations to pay their respects. Bobby and Ethel Kennedy were aboard as official mourners. Informed that Johnson was waiting to meet them in Union Station, Bobby whispered to Blake, wait until he lays an eye on me and you'll see ice. 55 The president, however, went straight to Jean and Arthur and embraced them. There was an embarrassing moment of confusion as they left for the capital, with Johnson's and Kennedy's chauffeurs jockeying for position and the President's Secret Service men finally leaping in front of the Kennedy car, I wish they'd been that alert in Dallas, Bobby said, but the President seemed too moved to have eyes for anyone except the General's widow and son. In the Great Rotunda, his face clenched with emotion, he placed a wreath of red, white, and blue flowers at the foot of the coffin. It lay and stayed there until the following afternoon, when the procession reformed and took it to Washington National Airport. A government plane flew it to the Naval Air Station in Norfolk, the third city in which the body lay in state for public mourners. On Saturday, after services in St. Paul's Episcopal Church, the congregation included Yoshida who had boarded the first flight from Tokyo when he learned of MacArthur's death, it was entombed in Norfolk's 114-year-old courthouse, which was then dedicated as a memorial to the general. There he lies now, in a cool crypt beneath the silent calm of sepulchral stone. 56 The memorial has become a shrine. Outside, a statue shows MacArthur in a swashbuckling stance, inside is an immense collection of memorabilia, medals, pipes, canes, banners, swords, caps, sunglasses, even the black limousine he rode to and from the Daiki building for five years. His Masonic regalia is there.
and the onyx clock that stood on the bookcase of his daiki office, and cartoons of him, and his rainbow division batch, and the pistol he carried during his Vera Cruz mission in 1914, and his familial coat of arms, and the MacArthur Darton. It goes on and on. If these walls could talk, one feels, they would say something preposterous. Yet the relics all seem curiously irrelevant. The spirit of the man is absent. He was more than swagger and frippery. He was certainly a poser, but his imposture screened, not weakness, but immense force. Like Lyndon Johnson, another strutter, he could never persuade himself that others could behold his naked power without flinching. So both emperors wore clothes, and the wrong clothes, until a nation of spectators concluded that there was nothing there except gaudy costuming. In Asia MacArthur was appreciated, because Orientals know how to peer around elaborate facades and find the hidden essence of a man. They value deceit, aware that it can mask honor as well as shame, they respect one who seems to be less than he is, who wants to keep the best of himself to himself. Heraclitus, who understood this, said that a man's character is his fate. MacArthur's fate was extraordinary because his character was extraordinary. The difficulty lies in defining its nature. He was always elusive, but never more so than here. New York funeral procession for MacArthur, April 1964. Possibly the quintessence of the man lives in images which cannot be preserved and displayed in a museum like Norfolk's. If it were possible to peer back into his life, their rays might be seen darting in and out, each casting a brief but revealing beam, showing him becoming what he was by glimpses of what had happened to him. In a sense, and in his case particularly, every man is all the people he has been. If one starts at Walter Reed and reverses MacArthur's lifetime, peeling away layer after layer of Langsine like a movie reel being rewound, the film spinning into the past, the general may be seen in unquiet retirement, then defying Truman, then locked in Korea's hopeless stalemate, and then ruling post-war Japan. That viceroy would then be perceived evolving in the years that prepared him for his shogunate, those of his audacious campaigns against Hirohito's armies. The seeds of that daring, in turn, would be found to have been sown on Badan, as his stand the grew out of his years of anticipation between the two great wars, out of the mud and horror of the Argonne, and, before that, in his long apprenticeship to peril. But the most valuable flashes would be provided by gleams too intimate to be disclosed on this wide screen of history, recollections which nevertheless lie in the past like veterans waiting to be summoned to the colors. Here their regressing reflections would rouse memories of the Pacific's liquefaction, one sound made of many, the parting and joining of the distant waves, the wicker of plunging anchor chains, and the groaning of Higgins boats shifting in their davits, of glimpses of shell-shredded palm fronds ragged against the savage tropical horizon at dawn, of soldiers moving jerkily down cargo nets, of the urgent rush of GI boot on hostile shore, and of the curious greys of combat, as though the mists of battle had drained away all colour, of remembrance of the nauseous terror within as he defied sniper fire again and again, then the starchy scent of freshly ironed khaki, his tenderness as he held his frightened son during the bombardments of Corregidor, his surges of devotion in Jean's arms, and, in the dazzling, sunlit, Kiplingisk flood tide of his youth, his rapturous submission to the seductive pull of 19th century militarism as he donned his first captain's uniform and stepped out joyously with a full 30 inch stride to Sousa strains leading the long gray line across the plain. Back and forth the fantastic tableaus would spin. Past his cruel pleb hazing, the self-discovery at the West Texas Military Academy, the patriarchal Judge MacArthur, all beard and cigar smoke, presiding over dynastic feasts at Washington's 1201 N Street, the chimes of the drawing room clock the telling off the quarters, the ceremonial changing of the guard at Leavenworth his father's tales of Sherman's dauntless boys in blue, his mother's imperious commands to fight and fight and never lower his blade short of victory.
the clean crack of crag rifles and the warm prickling of desert sand on his bare feet as he played with his brother outside the fort stockade, the rumbling of the sunset gun and Pinky's face tilting downward, her lambent smile gilding the child's upturned features while he clutched at her cascading skirts, the yellow notes of bugles as he stirred in his cradle, the chant of sergeant sparking cadence on the parade ground outside, and, snapping proudly in the overarching sky above him, the flag, and the flag, and the flag.